Welcome to another episode of Homebrews in Focus. Today we're going to be looking at Witch and Wiz, a NES homebrew puzzle game that's just releasing. And with me is developer Matt Hewson. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Oh, great. Um, before we kind of go f- into it, I was wondering if you can give uh, the viewers a little bit of a background about yourself. Sure. Yeah, I've been uh, making NES games for... I guess about a year and a half now, maybe a little bit longer. Um, I released my first game almost a year ago to the day, actually, uh, which was kind of a Tetris-like game called From Below. And I had worked on that for, I think, about six months prior to releasing it. So that was when I first kind of got into um, Nestev, uh, NES development, and... Prior to that, I had done a whole bunch of kind of smaller indie projects, a lot of Pico 8 stuff. Um, and then before that and kind of during that, I did Mono Game, which is a 2D kind of framework based on XNA. Another 2D framework that I kind of used before that. Um, so just been doing a whole bunch of different little indie games for the last uh, 15 years, I guess, since I started programming. And at the same time, I'm a professional game developer during the day as well, but that's much more like modern, big budget kind of stuff. So this scratches the itch of kind of being able to do everything, be the whole production crew and not have to rely on anyone else. So that's why I do this stuff on the side. Um, yeah, I've been into NES my whole life. I was born in 82. So when I was nine or 10, it was kind of the B end. Yeah, it was everything <laughs> at, that, at that era. So, uh, yeah, it stuck with me. I started collecting NES games in the late 90s. Um, got a pretty sizable collection at one point. Sold a lot of it. but uh, And then I got into emulation around the same time. I, I ran emulation sites. Um, yeah, and I just kind of, like, I don't know, stumbled along in yeah. different ways in the NES scene. Didn't really know about homebrew at all, which I've heard other people say as well, which is weird because I was so into the NES and collected. I ran sites. Yeah. I was a developer myself, but I kind of always thought of it as like very technical kind of proof of mm-hmm. concept stuff. Like I had seen, I think like tic-tac-toe, things like that on uh, yeah. like NES world sites like that. But it, I always thought of it as like, oh, cool. Someone actually like is able to run code on an NES. I never thought of it as, um, like real game games. Mm-hmm. I think it was either Micromages or N- Nescape. I can't remember which one came first. Whichever one did on mm-hmm. Kickstarter. That uh, kind of piqued my interest. And yeah. Me into Homebrew. I picked up a book called uh, right over here, Making, NES, Making Games for the NES by Stephen Hug. Okay. Um, read that and then read the Nestug tutorials book. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of made from below straight out of the tutorials. Uh, and yeah, sorry, a bit long winded, but that's actually, you made this really easy. You, uh, kind of <laughs> <laughs> touch upon all these questions I want to ask you. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, like you were saying, that's, um, that happens often. I think where people don't know about homebrew all of a sudden, it's yeah. this big world, um, that for whatever reason, just never made it onto their radar. and Yeah. I think I for collectors, too, it's really fun because you mm-hmm. definitely get to a point and emulate, even people who just play NES games on an emulator, you kind of get to a point where you've seen everything, especially yeah. emulation. Like you get, you get kind of bored of it, and then suddenly, even games in general, I think, like, by the time it, you don't go into a store and see a game you've never heard of anymore. Right? Everything is so broadcast, so uh, telegraphed, and you don't have yeah. that excitement of like going into Blockbuster and seeing a game and flipping it over and discovering what it is. But with Homebrew, it was that once again. Yeah. Was, I just had no idea. No one was talking about it. It's obviously so niche that you're not like talking about it around the the water cooler at work or something. Yeah. <laughs> and I work in games, and people, even in games, people don't know about this. Um, so yeah, it was pretty exciting just to, especially I'd listen to uh, NES Assembly Line. Yeah, and that's an audio podcast. So they'd be describing this game, and in my head, 
like, trying to figure out <laughs> what is this game. It's so, uh, so yeah, I felt like a kid reading Nintendo Power or something. Yeah, this game from Japan, and you're trying to put two and two together. You have like maybe two screenshots, and <laughs> yeah, I felt like that again. Really exciting. A bit of that's gone now because I've kind of like gone through as much as I can. I think at this point, but still finding random things here and there. Um, yeah, so I'm, I think it's exciting. I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, that is the the intrigue on my side too. Uh, you know, at least initially was oh these these games that. Um, there's no information out there about them. They're brand yeah. new to basically everybody or, you know, even you thinking back to uh, maybe some games back when you're a kid, they might have been out for a few months or a year, but you you had no idea. And you saw it one day, and you're like, oh, great. Yeah. And yeah, getting you're going the to a friend's house and they yeah. just got a stack of games you never heard of half yeah. of them. Um, so going back to, to a couple things you said about uh, you as a developer. Mm-hmm. So, initially, you were you were doing a lot of Pico Eight stuff. What what drove you to move over to developing for the NES? Um, or are you still doing both? You know, what what's the story behind that? Um, I think in the back of my head, I always imagined I would make an NES game. It was one of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, I won't say always, but like, or not that I would always make make a game. It was just without explicitly saying it out loud, just like, obviously, obviously, if I yeah, have right. an opportunity of yes to making an NES game. And I think just the pieces came together where I realized, oh, I actually can make it. I didn't even realize this was possible. And it was just an obvious choice. But, like, I've always been into retro-looking games. And I think a lot of people who, well, not a lot, I don't know, people I follow anyway, who work in that space, I think try to get closer and closer to authentic hardware looking stuff. Mm, like, yeah. Like they adhere to palette restrictions and sprite limits and stuff like that. And Pico 8 is like an obvious um, kind of place to go if you're into that stuff because it has those restrictions built in. You can't, it's not the same restrictions as the NES, but it has restrictions, which if you're kind of interested in that, mm-hmm. uh, it's an obvious place to go. So um, I'm still into Pico 8. I kind of got to the point with Pico 8 where um, you really start hitting the limits a lot and you spend, and at NES developments like this to an extent as well, but you spend like 80% of your time just optimizing and trying to yeah. fit things in memory because um, it's even more restrictive than uh, the NES in a lot of ways. So yeah, it got to the point where the projects I wanted to make didn't really fit in anymore. Mm-hmm. And the development environment's not the... It's friend, It's actually super friendly, but there's no debugging and stuff like that. So some mm-hmm. of the things I'm kind of used to um, started to grant on me. So from there, I actually made my own kind of version of Pico 8 in C Sharp that I can mm-hmm. remove the limits, but keep some of them, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I didn't really answer the question, but... Um, there wasn't an obvious point where I was like, oh, yeah. time to move from this thing to this thing. It was just kind of working on stuff and one day realizing, oh, I can I can probably have a go at this. And just doing it. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, let's, let's take a look at this trailer for the game so we can give everyone an idea of the game we're discussing. And it's a really well put together trailer. So let's let's take a look at it. Oh, really exciting. Uh, 
Yeah, I actually, so that was, um, I, I got that through Fiverr. Mm. Contrary to the name, it's not $5. <laughs> prices. But yeah, I just hired a guy on there mm-hmm. um, named uh, Cat Corp. Okay. Like he does, uh, I think it's mostly like YouTuber intros and mm-hmm. stuff like that and little uh, sizzle reels and stuff like that. But um, kind of just pitched the idea, sent him a bunch of footage. And he said, yeah, that. yeah I'm super happy with it because I hate video editing. I can't, <laughs> I can't stand it. It's one of those things where I'm super picky, mm-hmm. but I don't have the skills to actually do it properly. So I just yeah. say like, things like, no, nah, that doesn't, I don't, it's not right, but I don't know why. So. It's yeah. For me to just hire somebody. Oh, well, at least at least you recognize that, and you did uh, <laughs> yeah. search out someone. It took fifteen years for me to <laughs> making games to realize. It. Yeah, you know, you can't like. I, it's probably maybe some people come naturally, but as you get older, you kind of realize what you excel at and what's what's better for you to to source out to to somebody. You know, to put together, use their talents. Yeah. Um, so what we kind of saw from from the trailer that it's this puzzle game and there's many different challenges and it's all presented with these great visuals and overarching story. And also noted in there, the game is being released digitally, physically, and is also going to be available on Pie Packer. Yeah. One of the things before we kind of go more into the gameplay is... What set you on the path to make Witch and Wiz? Because you came off into the scene, um, Riesling from below, and made a, a name for yourself. But then you kind of upped the ante, and now you release a larger, a larger game very fast. You know, what drove you for Witch and Wiz? I kind of set out with a plan. Um, I don't know when, but around when I started to kind of get a sense of what making an NES game is. Probably after I finished the tutorials and. Things. A better sense of like what yeah. is actually difficult about this, what's easy, what's hard. Um, so I set it up with a plan to basically do three games. The first one would be what became From Below, but originally it was just going to be Tetris, a mm-hmm. Tetris clone. I was just going to release it for free, um, and it would just be kind of like get my foot in the door, figure it out. Second game I wanted to do was. Um, that was going to be my first physical. My plan was to make that a physical release. And once I kind of figured things out, do a really small physical run, mm-hmm. let's say 50 copies of something. Uh, it would still be single screen. I was still planning for it to be Enrom, um, but it would be kind of a polished, complex, same complexity as the first game, but more polished. Mm-hmm. And then my third game, I was aiming for like a platformer with uh, scrolling. And uh, an advanced mapper beyond Enrom stuff like that. So after From Below, more or less finished, uh, I got a lot of requests to sell to mm-hmm. uh, buy physical copies. So I kind of shifted those plans around a bit. And what was going to be kind of my second game, my vision of what the second game would be, became the first game, which was From Below. So okay. I did a small run, physical copies. Um, yeah, polished it up quite a bit, um, stuff like that. So then the second game was originally just going to be Enron, but at that point, I kind of felt like I, I kind of got it. Yeah. Point. So I moved to uh, MMC1. Um, I, I basically just wanted more memory, yeah, more more uh, code, more graphics, and uh, save, save room, working room. So uh, I picked Witch and Wiz because... I'd already uh, built the game for, or built a version of the game for Pico Eight. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the, a lot of the design questions were already done. I kind of knew how to build the game roughly, um, but I also had a lot of ideas to expand on the original version, like the Pico Eight version. So uh, the original version was thirty-two levels. This one's a little over a hundred. Um, the first one had kind of three. Gameplay mechanics, whereas mm-hmm. this one has seven, I guess. Maybe, depending on how you look at it. But um, so I just had a lot of ideas on how to expand it. it. Seemed like a good. It doesn't have scrolling. I could in the Pico Eight version, it required uh, scrolling because of the screen size. But it turned out I could fit every puzzle on screen. Um, 
on the NES, so I didn't have to do screen scrolling, so I could kind of focus on the, the map or technology and the gameplay, having something that's more um, action-based, real-time. Like, it, Tetris is somewhat action-based and somewhat real-time, more than maybe it seems, actually, but um, this is multiple objects. Yeah. Uh, just kind of a step up from that. So that's kind of why I picked it. it. It added a certain level of additional complexity without kind of jumping the shark and ending up spending four years or whatever on, on the project, which I'm not interested in at all. So, <laughs> um, yeah, when I got into Pico 8, actually, mm -hmm. sorry, tangent, um, just prior, actually, just prior to making uh, Witch and Wiz, I did mm -hmm. a, a game a month for a year. Yeah, it's like a kind of game developer challenge, self challenge. So I learned a lot from that, uh, how to produce a game in a very short time, how to get to the crux of a, a core gameplay mechanic really, really quickly, uh, and make a full game loop in, in a very short time. And in that process is where I found uh, and I got into PQA because it's really, really good for stuff like that. And when I came out of that, I was kind of burnt out on quick demos. So uh, yeah. Witch and Wiz was meant to be uh, like a month or two project, but polished, mm -hmm. finished, and that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. So anyway, that's that was kind of why I did Witch and Wiz after. Yeah, it was, it was that. It was, it, the the core thing was more action and a more advanced mapper. Mm -hmm. And so, next project I'm hoping to do probably a platformer, which is really yeah. what I like doing. That's kind of what I've done mostly in the past. So. Scrolling, probably MMC3, uh, just starting, literally last night, just started looking. Nice. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to recreate the Ninja Gaiden 2 train mm -hmm. sequence with the parallax and stuff, so start there, and then just add some guys, and I'm sure you're good to go. <laughs> yeah. um, so anyway, that's that's kind of the next point. Yeah. The, that's kind of the, all these, to me, are kind of mm -hmm. stepping stones from below in which and Wizard. Yeah. Stepping stones to what I really want to make, which is mm. actual platformers, Contra, Mario, Mega yeah. one of my, my go to games. I'm not I am actually not into I'm more into Tetris now, but when I made From Below mm -hmm. into it at all. Um puzzle platformers, kinda like I like Fire and Ice, Lolo. Uh, but I wouldn't consider myself like a puzzle platformer guy. Yeah. So I'm gonna get to my my base soon. Uh, you you never you don't sleep. You went right to you keep going. <laughs> um, so you took the Pico Eight prototype and you kind of, you made it into the Nest Dev uh, Compo entry, which got really well received. And you took second place in the Compo. Initially, is that where you planned the project to stop, or did you always plan for it to go into a full game? No, I, I'm. I'm fair, yeah, I'm like 99% sure I always mm -hmm. plan for it to be a full game. Mm -hmm. For the, the Nest Dev Compo, yeah, I can't remember how the order of things work, even though this was like a couple months ago. I have a terrible memory. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure I, I was at the time planning to do a full release. Yeah. And, but I, I kind of think of things in milestones and like somewhat professional like production cycles. So yeah. my thought was I'll recreate the Pico 8 version on the NES. So those 32 levels, I think I mentioned before, mm -hmm. the three gameplay mechanics, just verbatim exactly what was in the Pico A version. And the nice part about doing stuff like that and same with making Tetris um, is all of the design decisions are done. You know exactly what it should be like. You've probably solved some of the problems before um, if, if you built it for Pico A or whatever. But even if it, you're just looking at someone else's game, like you can kind of go, oh, why did they do that and work it out in your head? Like they, they solve some problem doing maybe something that seems awkward. So anyway, I took out all the design constraints. So I just focused on memory, graphics, music. But it was also kind of weird because the Nestev competition uses a different mapper. It uses, I can't remember now. But, uh, yeah, based on the compo yeah, rules, actually, it has a, yeah. certain, uh, a certain restrictions. So everyone's on the same mapper, so they can... They can make the multi car yeah, after. Exactly. Yeah, it's the Action 53 mm -hmm. uh, mapper, which is quite different from the one I was using. It was, I think, like 64K, whereas I'm using 256K kilobytes. Um, and it uses RAM for the, for the 
that's right instead of wrong. So a lot, I had some a lot of help with that from a, you know, someone named Noro on Nestev, who basically did the whole like port map report for me. Mm-hmm. I wrote it in um, MMC one, and then they just did all the magic for me to um, turn it into compressed memory and then load it into RAM to character RAM when I needed it. So yeah, very thankful for that. Um, so yeah, th- that was kind of the plan. Get out the door, use it a little bit to kind of get awareness about the game. People can see kind of what it's about. But it was yeah. a bit of a double, double-edged sword because now there's so many versions of the game out that I constantly have to kind of preface what mm-hmm. it is. And the Pico 8 one's a little simpler because it's kind of totally like in another zone. But the Nestev one, like some people think of it as a demo, which mm-hmm. maybe it is, but it's not what I would have built if I was making a demo. A demo yeah. I would have showcased the breadth of like graphics and music and gameplay mechanics, whereas that is more like a a full game that's just less expansive. It only has one tile set for the whole game. It doesn't have like I think it has one song, one main song for for the whole game. Uh, yeah, so it's much more I don't know. It's it's weird because I have to tell people like it's not a demo. It's just like a like an alpha or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. It was it was good in the end. I'm sure just to kind of get people aware of it, um, and then being able to kind of place in the competition was like really um, gratifying for me. It's something I like, I know I've only been doing this for. Year and a half, but in that time, I've kind of been listening to, as I said, the Assembly Line mm-hmm. podcast, hearing their like, six hour episodes on all the games and stuff, and thinking, oh, yeah. day I hope to be like on that cart. That was like a, a, a goal initially, just when I wasn't like kind of aware that I would make From Below into a cart, was like actually having a physical NES cart with my game on it. So, um, getting to do that was really, really cool. I'm really happy with it. Um, I probably won't see the cart till like 2030, but when it comes, um, just joking, but uh, <laughs> half serious, half <laughs> Um, so yeah, yeah, that was, that was really cool. Really happy with the outcome. Mm-hmm. I mean, hate the space goals guys because that game's pretty <laughs> spectacular, uh, but no hard feelings. <laughs> that's, that's great. That's great to hear. I was going to plan to kind of go into the gameplay now. Um, we can keep talking, unless there's something uh, you want to talk about before we, we jump into the gameplay. No, no, that's good. All right. So we're at the title screen right now, and this is going to play for a second. Um, there's some information in the manual that kind of gives you a brief before the gameplay story. And you describe that a world that could be mistaken for our own world, except magic is commonplace. Uh, over time, however, magic was lost to time or forgotten. And the only people that use magic were are these uh, group of people called outcasters. And children and people are, I'm guessing, kind of afraid of magic and they stay away from it, but sometimes kids venture off and they interact with it and then they disappear and the game kind of opens to to this yep yeah you got it man. i kind of <laughs> thought of it as uh like a grim grim's fairy tale that kind of vibe um a little yeah yeah not i haven't like built a huge world in my head around all this or anything yeah um i felt that it was important to kind of Ground. I, I wrote quite a bit actually of kind of what I thought was going on in this world and why people are doing what they're doing. So I kind of like uh, like grounded, like sci-fi fantasy kind of mm-hmm. stuff where it's not like, really just kind of over the top magic. And I like there to be rules. It's like yeah. Game of Thrones and stuff. Um, so yeah, and I also, I really, really love, um, especially NES does this a lot, games where there's like lots of 
artifacts and magic items that feel kind of real and random. Like it's not get the six pendants of truth or something like that. And you know there's six and you're filling this out. I really yeah. like where you just kind of pick up a random item and say, this is a whistle. It does this random thing. So that's so also a good example of six pendants. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so I kind of wanted to touch on that. I wanted to the way I think about it, the, the different abilities you get throughout the game are from magical artifacts that are kind of yeah. kept in this tower of this dark sorceress. And in my head, they're kind of just a few of many that kind of are in this world. Like they're kind of kept secret and hidden. So, um, yeah, I imagine there's kind of all sorts of kind of hidden stuff. I can imagine another game, <laughs> more like an adventure game. Brief stuff, or maybe some of the things you find here, like the flames, the different colored flames. Yeah. Maybe those are part of a set, and this like, sorceress has two of doing the exact thing I just said. I don't think the game's going to be like that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my, my goal here with this prologue, I call it, mm -hmm. uh, was to set up the story of these two kids, young kids, kind of just adventuring in the woods. And just going a little too deep, like a Hansel and Gretel kind of story. Um, and discovering this cabin in the woods we see here, um, with a magical artifact in it. And the girl kind of like just decides to touch it, goes a little too far. And in the process, awakens something which inadvertently ends up abducting the boy because he just yeah. happens to be in the line of fire. With him. And then we go five years later. So I imagine during this time she's trying to figure out like what happened to him researching what went wrong uh, learning about magic so like, kind of like in training like, kind mm -hmm. of the Jedi kind of thing this is I don't know if it's obvious here this is the boy's house here mm -hmm. where you started uh, the game so you can see that after he's gone the family's collapsed my, my um, intent was the first half of the prologue they use a different color palette. It's bright. The music's super mm -hmm. cheap. It's supposed to feel kind of like like a classic Indian game, really over the top, mm -hmm. joyful. And then something tragic happens, and we jump ahead to this dark forest, no music. Um, and she's retracing the steps of what they did, um, going back to the cabin here. Um, and then, simple enough, there's a trap door in the, <laughs> the bottom. <that> <laughs> the secret uh, entrance to the Dark Sorceress's tower where the boy is being taken. So I really wanted to have a non uh, a story with no dialogue, no mm -hmm. cutscenes. I wanted it to be partly a, I want my kids I think about my kids and wanting them to play, I have young kids um, wanting to be able to play this and understand it and with that in mind, mean anybody can understand it. It's kind of universal story. Like a picture book. Basically. Yeah. You really need to read the words. So that was kind of what I was going for. I don't know if it was super successful. Uh, it's quite difficult making, communicating that stuff in such a small... Yeah. Without it being like a game about cinematic. So all that stuff in there, I kind of built it with the puzzle engine. Yeah. With puzzles that have no enemies and one exit, so somewhat limited in what I could do. So. And then, yeah, after that, you enter chapter one, and then the, the actual puzzles begin. And so the first chapter is meant to be just the most basic type of puzzle, which is kind of a Sokoban mm -hmm. style game, pushing blocks, kill all the enemies, and then you kill all the enemies, you clear the level. And so this is... Uh, this is from the Nestev compo, all the levels here, also from the Pico 8 version in this chapter, but updated graphics, updated enemies. But the exact same was. And then, the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, the your world the world is hot it's very detailed, all your backgrounds and everything. Um coming off really good. The shading's great. Um yeah. and what you're saying. What you're saying about the prologue and everything, and even if you don't read the manual, I think you you get an understanding. You can understand this is um, a flashback scene with the kind of the green tint on the screen, 
that your your friend has taken the time pass and now you're going after them. So I think you can dive right in, get a handle on the story, which is 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 a great and refreshing. I, I say this about a lot of games. I like the games where you can uh, you can get right into the gameplay. Yeah, it originally intended um, when you start a new game that it would ask you if you want to skip the prologue, mm-hmm. so that if because especially me developing, it gets super annoying playing through that thing over and over again. But it's so quick. Like one, like there's no thinking really, and yeah, somebody who's already beaten the game, you can play any level you want. It's really just for people. It would have been for people who beat the game, wanted to start a new save game, and didn't yeah. play the prologue. So it became so niche at that point that um, it kind of it's not worth the effort. Change the flow. There's all sorts of things. That but yeah, you mentioned the art. We should call out uh, Kenneth and Al who are um, two main artists on the game. Uh, Kenneth did most of the background work and uh, a bunch of the enemies, and Alp did uh, a bunch of the character work. They also they kind of crossed over as well, but that's mm-hmm. kind of a majority of the, the difference. And then uh, Howard Zoltan, who goes by uh, Zoli Online, uh, mm-hmm. who did the artwork for From Below. He did. Uh, he did some stuff early on for the game as well. well actually, a lot of the forest mm-hmm. set prologue that was in, as well as the title screen. So you had a couple other people on the team as well. You want to take a minute to kind of talk about them. You had some for music and sound, mm-hmm. and uh, I think that kind of rounds it out um, because you talked about uh, sprites, arts. Um, and then you had someone do the box and manual art. Yeah, so the music is the music and the sound effects are mm. by a guy named Tui, who also did From Below. He's done a whole bunch of stuff, actually. I don't want to miss I'm not going to try to name <laughs> his credits, but he's done a whole bunch of NES games. A um, bunch of stuff for Nestev Combo. So yeah, I worked with him on From Below and Witch and Wiz. Yeah, he did like. 16 or 17 tracks for this. It's mm-hmm. quite, quite extensive. Uh, it's been awesome to work with. Uh, and then the box art and the manual art, uh, special edition box art, uh, was done by a girl named uh, Floor Corey. Uh, and she does, she does amazing illustration work. I think she's in Mexico. There's a lot of Pokemon fan art, but okay. it's like really, really nice. It, it looks very similar to the Witch and Wizard, where it's kind of mm-hmm. saturated, mm. um, bright, cheerful. It was kind of exactly what I was looking for for this game, which is um, I wanted it to feel really like approachable and not, mm-hmm. like, although it's witches and dungeons and stuff like that, I didn't want it to feel like a fantasy game or fantasy game in the sense of like Dungeons and Dragons that kind of thing yeah. I that vibe at all I wanted it to feel more like a like Candy Crush or something mm. like that if I had to pick something um, or Bubble Bobble like Lolo those kind of like just big bright cheerful I wanted like my mom would look at it and say oh I'm a big game but I kind of wanted it to um, really like accessible in that sense yeah because it is a puzzle game like it's not going to attract like the most hardcore gamers, it's going to probably be attractive to kind of people who like puzzle games, which is not really the same demographic. So yeah, she did just an amazing job. Couldn't be more happy with the, the artwork she did. And, um, yeah, yeah, really happy. So yeah, and then the other guys did the artwork. And, yeah, it's, and a whole bunch of beta testers. I couldn't name them all, but um, just tons and tons of help with beta testing. Website. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I I guess since you mentioned it, because I was going to save this for later, but we could talk about it now. Um, how did you build up that momentum? So the development was, in my opinion, fast. You got a, a strong community behind you, and even your beta testing was uh, uh, time compressed, and you got it done very fast with engaged people. How, how do you uh, keep that momentum? Or how'd you build that community of support? Um, I don't know exactly. Um, 
I do try to be quite active, like on social media and stuff, and mm -hmm. post a lot of development shots. I'm very like I'm a big believer in the idea that you sell the game for like the years prior to actually releasing it, not on mm -hmm. the day that it comes out. Yeah. You sell like I think that's why I love and I'm sure why a lot of people love Kickstarter and stuff. It's not really the game a lot of the times in the end, because you can just go to Steam and buy the game. Yeah. Once it comes out. I mean physical stuff is a bit different. But for me it's hearing from the developers, seeing what they're going through, seeing the ups and downs. Um, so I try to share a lot of that stuff. Um, I think that's part of it is that people feel invested and it's not just some random game. There's mm -hmm. a puzzle game who cares. There's a million of those on Android. So get right now probably with the exact same game mechanics. Um, so I think you have to have something beyond that to attract people. Which, yeah, to me is just sharing, maybe oversharing, mm -hmm. showing um, things progressing, taking feedback, lots of feedback. Um, I think probably like a lot of the people who beta tested this beta tested from below as well. Mm. Um, so I think there's a bit of a community already built up there uh, that kind of naturally transition over. But even from below had a, like a really strong beta. I was quite surprised because I, I heard a lot of horror stories, not horror stories, but um, it's very easy to kind of get people to say they're interested, but to actually sit down and play a game yeah. over and over and over again, it's it's not fun. it's not really fun. And especially if you're into the game. Like, I don't do any beta tests because if the game's interesting enough to me that I want to beta test it, mm -hmm. I don't want to spoil it. I don't want to see half yeah. of the game. I want to I kind of want to see the final want to experience it as the final product. So um yeah, I'm not quite sure. Like I'm I'm super happy that it worked, but I don't know about it secret or anything i think it's i think it's really just like a battle of attrition just trying to post as regularly as can even when like, it feels like i'm just showing nothing which often yeah. it is and people don't react or whatever but i do kind of although it is mostly a hobby i do treat it pretty serious i try to like post things on reddit and facebook and try to get like a little bit of so outside of the kind of core demographic or the core kind of homebrew group and I don't know if it, how successful it is but yeah and I've been making like I was part of the Pico 8 community for a while which is a pretty like a similar kind of community to ASCAD so I think some of it transitions from there maybe not the beta testing side of it but certainly like just the community side of the conversation yeah. reacting to GIFs GIFs sorry. So. <laughs> so is a gif or is a gif for you i say gif but i know that it's GIF. so that's probably <laughs> makes me the worst kind of person <laughs> i think uh that that would be the same for me <laughs> gif <laughs> oh, you're about to restart this level for a sec that's so frustrating like watching uh people play this game is mm -hmm. horrifying because <laughs> you just see them like right there, it's like solved. And like, mm, I guess I'm stuck in resets. <laughs> Especially with streamers and stuff like, like during that dev, I watched a bunch yeah. of this. It's really hard. There. You're doing well here. I guess this is your second run, right? Second run. I, I played through once before. It's how I approach most of the games for, for the show. Mm -hmm. I'll play through once or twice, and then I'll do it again because you, you get better at the game, you know? Mm -hmm. So I want to show it realistically, but a little. I don't want to show every mistake and the slowdown in game. So yeah, it's um, fun too because I see um, I see solutions I had no idea existed a lot. Yeah, it's just fun. Um, and during the beta test, like sometimes you whittle, like you iterate on a puzzle so long. That your mind is so focused on like one little like yeah. thing, like oh they need to get this block on top of this other thing focus on all these little things to make that happen and you forget that they can just walk over top and complete the level <laughs> in for three seconds it's like oh my god what like, <laughs> puzzles yeah I would watch in the beta and I just couldn't even remember what I was thinking it just yeah. the original vision in my head is just gone and I, I see it's, oh yeah you just walk across the screen and kill that enemy. What was I thinking? 
and then yeah, they go back and just add complexity until it's. That's that kind of happens. Yeah, you you get stuck. Like, uh, even like, even like uh, with me playing the game, like I'm like. Oh, I keep restarting this level. Like I know that I know I have to do this, but I can keep doing the same step, and it's the completely wrong step. But I keep doing it because <laughs> that's how I think it's supposed to go. <laughs> and other people have the opposite problem, where mm. they're afraid to try anything. Mm. They'll they'll try to plan it all out in their head, but yeah. a lot of the time you just kind of have to move stuff around. Yeah, something will click, and you realize, oh, I didn't think of that. I can push blocks from. A ladder, mm. stuff like there's things. Maybe, maybe you don't have the f you think yeah. you have all the mechanics, but there's one or two missing things. Uh, so yeah. you're, you're pretty good um, when you play through the game to show the player when there's a new mechanic or every mechanic at a smaller scale for each chapter. This is a new mechanic, and I'll ease you into it. And yeah. there's only, and we'll get to it later, but there's only one mechanic where I like completely forgot I could do it and we'll, we'll show yeah. it later <laughs> it yes yeah, so you just you just entered the first uh, new um, kind of magical artifact which is the portal we call it this is a, it was originally like I call it the labyrinth actually mm -hmm. but it doesn't really make sense anymore when you see it I was originally imagining it um, like the stairs that you go out one and come out the other oh one. yeah 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 uh, I forget what that's called. Etchers. Etchers. Yeah, I don't remember its name. You can dub me in to say the, the correct <laughs> smoke. Um, but that was how I originally envisioned it, mm -hmm. but we can't really get a tile set that looked yeah. right. And that is, is really challenging. It's lots of angles. And at the same time, it's got to be background, because you're not actually traveling in this so Yeah. In the end, I just added, like, I, this is one of them few pieces of art I did in the game with this border. Mm. Like a, a noise border, which I'm not super crazy about. But, um, the idea, so the, the part you played a minute ago where you go into the portal, mm -hmm. um, what I was trying to do is kind of communicate what happens when you go through the edge of the screen. So yeah. in my mind, you go in and there's like kind of navigating this weird mm. void okay. to get to the other side. It's like amazing, but you don't have to see that every time. So that's what that's supposed to be. And then in the end, you just teleport. And this is kind of interesting because this one, I this is actually the most um, complex coding, I think, for any of the mechanics in the game. And that's because originally when I did it, I was like, well, it's just the NES. Like, this is classic. You just loop, it loops naturally. You don't have to do any extra work, it just happens because that it's, it's like the size of an 8-bit number. So, uh, but then what I realized, or someone pointed out, I think this bit, uh, is that one, like on a CRT, that doesn't work because that means that the, if you, like in some of these, I'll have a block right on the edge mm -hmm. that will push off the screen. And that doesn't work on a CRT because it'll actually be hidden. So I need all of the, Play a playable area inside of the CRT safe zone, which means okay, I can't teleport like right at the edge. I need to teleport mm. one tile in from the edge. And then on top of that, I realized later I can't just like teleport from the bottom to the top of the screen. I need to teleport to below the HUD. So it ends up being like a, like it's not complicated. I'm sure if I'm saying this, because you're a terrible player. Um, but it, on the NES, it's somewhat complicated because you get. You get a lot out of when things are kind of those natural colors, yeah. and suddenly it's not. And now I have these divides all over the place, and these like checks for am I going down? And okay, that means don't just go to the top; go to like the top plus mm -hmm. three tiles and stuff like that. So it ended up being yeah one of the more complicated mechanics when I thought it was going to be the simplest. Initially, it was the simplest, and it was, like, didn't have to do anything. And then there's all the stuff of. Uh, but that was one. Um, this is stuff of like you have to push a block across the void, and it has two at the same time, so you can see it. Like you can see two players at the same time there when you cross the threshold, so that yeah, 
it's clear that you're recording, although I'm not super happy with it. I should have made it so that it was a little bit more delayed, because right now you kind of see two whole bodies, which doesn't yeah. You should only see the, the part that's hidden on the other side, but anyway, nitpicky. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Give you a pass. You can be nitpicky about your own game. <laughs> but, like, what you were saying, like, um, I, I guess the challenge of that is, like, it was two two problems in one. You had a design problem about you... And ultimately, the solution was to add this border to solve the CRT's uh, safe zone to not be off the screen. And then you also had the coding uh, challenge, which maybe some of the other ones didn't... They weren't as complex because... Once one part of it or another part of it had an easy solution in your mind, and this one was a little bit more complex. Yeah, and there's on top of that, like there is the question of, like, does it even matter? And, like, do people care if like 99% of people who play this will probably play it on an emulator on a PC where they'll have full visibility to the edge of the screen. So, but I, don't know. I try to care about that stuff and hopefully stand out a bit by going the extra mile to as much as I can. Like I'm not, I'm not definitely not the most technical person in this community, but I try to kind of budge my way through it as much as possible and take the time to get those things, get those things right. There's a, lot, there's a million little things like that. The core gameplay is quite simple. It's yeah. all little stuff uh, makes it feel that makes the game feel special and not not just a thing of filling together flash games or something. It's derogatory to flash games. Flash games are cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? Some some little thing something like that. Well, a really complex but you know, poorly executed game is not a good game, but a, a seemingly simple game, but where very well executed is a great game, you know? Exactly. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel. I'd rather do something simple, but mm -hmm. polished, Yeah. with a lot of attention to detail, rather than kind of trying to take on the world. It's all about... But a big part of that is just knowing kind of what is complex. That's very hard to know in a lot of mm -hmm. So we're on the second chapter, and I have a question, and maybe you kind of fill in. And I think you started to. So, is there, um, in your mind, was there a linear progression in these chapters in the world? Are you like kind of starting at the base of the castle, then you kind of go through the caverns, and then you end up at the tower? It, or am I just kind of reading too much into it? No, yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, I didn't, I didn't hold myself. I think of it as like a Castlevania castle, mm -hmm. so... Oh, <laughs> <it's> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, and you'll see it actually in the uh, um, hand-drawn game guide. Mm -hmm. It's like a... In the guide, it's kind of like that, like a Castlevania castle, is it yeah. describes the, um, the solutions of some of the puzzles, and he, he did it just as like a linear vertical progression. Which doesn't make a ton of sense because the sewers are on the rooftop essentially in that flow. But yeah, in my mind, you're kind of zigzagging through, okay. going down to the sewer, like basically starting at the, the base, going through the, kind of the core castle, up to the clock tower, which is the one that flips, which we'll see mm -hmm. later. Um, then down to the sewers, which lead to the dungeons, which is where the wizards take the uh, health, and then. I wanted like a big, huge climb the tower moment, mm -hmm. but it was kind of boring. <laughs> All right, did you ever play uh, Metal Gear Three? Metal Gear Solid Two? Yes. No, I haven't. I've only played Metal Gear Solid One. I have Two and Three. It's on my backlog. I picked up that remaster for yes. PS Two at yeah, some point. It's the way to play. Uh, but anyway, in that, there's one point where you climb this ladder, mm -hmm. and it's like a five minute climb. They play. Like a theme song, yeah, with lyrics. It's like a James Bond song called Snake Eater. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you just climb for five minutes, and doing it once is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. But if you die in checkpoints before that, it's just yeah. the thing in the world. So I'm kind of mindful of stuff like that. So I decided to just make it one one screen, and you can use your imagination and climb 
a massive tower out of the out of the dungeons. Yeah. But yeah, it's a loose, loose, uh, imagined labyrinthy mm-hmm. castle. Um, you mentioned something, and I wonder about. I don't know how many people wonder about this. But I find it interesting. Is so. How do you? Ch- how do you? I guess. How do you choose what? Um, so there's two things. One was you felt it was important to um, at the beginning of chapter two to show what this um, white uh, border is, like that you go through and you navigate. You felt that was important to show that for the chapter to convey what that is. But um, as far as the progression in in this um, the castle or this game of the tower, um, you you felt that it wasn't important maybe to show like a map like Castlevania does. How do right. you how do you make those calls or? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's usually just weighing the cost versus benefit. Mm-hmm. So those intro screens. Um, the the benefit is is partially like kind of selling the world, making it feel a little bit more real. But I, I kind of think of them as palate cleansers. Mm-hmm. To have a, a breath before mm-hmm. you just solve the hardest puzzle of the previous chapter. Here's like a big kind of like a cutscene. Yeah, it might be in in another game. This is meant to be a moment of oh, okay, I did it, and, mm-hmm. and also a little tease of hey, you just like really like. Um, did something great, you're probably like feeling a little like okay, I need to walk away for a while. So I kind of want to tease something that's mm-hmm. oh, there's this whole new thing waiting for you back to disappear forever. So there's a bit of that. So anyway, that's that's kind of my thought process of why that's important. And the complexity of implementing it um, is quite, quite low, especially mm-hmm. after I did the first one. I did the one for the Nest Dev Compo just the mirror uh, sequence where you uh, mm-hmm. mirror clone. So that's kind of like most of them are the same thing as that. There's different things that you walk into, but generally you walk into something it flashes white and then you leave the screen. So um, the implementation there is quite easy and the payoff is, I think, worth it. So yeah, that's kind of the, uh, the cost benefit I do to decide what to keep and what not to keep. But it's tough. It's really tough with beta testers too, because mm-hmm. um, often people make really good arguments for why something, especially with bugs, like why it's important to fix this bug. Yeah. And a lot of the time the answer is just, well, I'm not going to fix it because that means I'm not going to fix something else. And I don't think this is bad enough to warrant spending the time on it. I can't wait for this forever, obviously. Or the fix may be worse than the, the bug, where, like, say that I mentioned earlier, um, the idea of skipping the prologue. Mm-hmm. Like, anytime you mess with flow, like starting the game at a different point, it's just, for me anyway, it's just breeding ground for, for bugs. Because now you have to test two flows, who knows what happens. Mm-hmm. But it just introduces a whole new path of the game. So, something like that, I'd be really hesitant to do. Like, it's hard to kind of communicate that, especially when people have really good arguments why something should be, should be done a certain way. Often, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I agree, but I'm ready to kind of uh, put this... Oh, see, that was a case where you just solved the puzzle. I've never seen it solved like that. Oh, well, how the, now I'm just of the other ways to do it. This is the only way I know how to do it. <laughs> it's, it's more or less the same, but I usually do it where I do mm-hmm. kind of one ghost at a time. And I just oh, okay, okay. Up. That was cool. Your way looks much more uh, it's climactic. <laughs> a lot, a lot more setup, and it took me a yeah. few tries to figure Better. it out. <laughs> Be good for the trip. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's kind of I just do mm-hmm. that kind of thought process. Of what's important to me? How much effort is it going to be? How many yeah. people are actually going to care about this? Um, sometimes, like I spent that prologue at the start, mm-hmm. I probably spent more time on that than any. Mm. That was probably a mistake. I think most people look at that and just go, oh, okay, cool. You like, made some forest levels and the guy floats away. Yeah. But that was like, yeah, tons and tons of time spent on that, getting it just right. Like, there's no cutscene engine, so I'm kind of hand coding everything. 
Yeah. It's so really slow, so yeah, you can make mistakes as well and stuff like that. I can understand the important for like a creative decision, you know, for you to communicate that was probably important. But like you're saying, going back to it was a time well spent, and um, I say yes, but you know, you know, but yeah, often it's like the in the I find each individual decision can mm -hmm. kind of feel dumb in some ways, but. Or like you're just why am I caring about this? It's, I'm spending too much time on this little thing, but twenty or thirty of those things adding up, it yeah. makes it feel like a, a full polished game. So kind of have to look at it a little bit more holistically. I think. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Watching this, you've already you've already screwed it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you never know. Maybe there's another solution I did that. I shouldn't be so uh, judgmental. <laughs> uh, I, I do appreciate your feedback on like how you make the decisions and it's it's interesting and I, I think that's kind of maybe useful for other people um, aspiring developers because I, well I, you can correct me if I'm wrong but I kind of imagine this you kind of learn this in your professional development uh, from your other games that you've done so maybe you're a mentor at some point and some pointed out some things uh, over your career to kind of think through whereas if someone doesn't have a mentor or the kind of years of experience of doing other game design they, they may not know that and they may fall down that rabbit hole of not doing that beforehand analysis that cost benefit and all of a sudden they've spent all this time on something that maybe wasn't worth it But yeah, um, <clears throat> what were you saying? You were saying about um, kind of learning, having that kind of experience, of yeah, making those decisions. Yeah, I think it, it's a big. I think the most um, like valuable experience in all this was the um, twelve or one game a month challenge mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier. Like going through that, we learn a lot about what it takes to. Finish a game, not just start a game. Which yeah. is, I'm sure you've heard it a million times, is the toughest part now is actually getting it out the door. So, yeah, I learned, learning a lot in there. And of course, yeah, working in the industry. I think that one helps more with kind of teamwork, learning how to you know, outsource work, you know, work with artists, stuff like that. Plan a project, a long-term project. Well, you just solve that one a different way too. I have like a whole thing where you have to go back through the ladder. It's a perfect example. So I'm mean, breaking my my plans. But yeah. <laughs> Not I'm sure. I'm sure we're gonna struggle with a bunch that there was a much easier solution, <laughs> and I did a much harder solution. <laughs> I find that it, like, just knowing the first enemy to kill or the mm -hmm. last enemy to kill is pretty much all you need to really solve it. it mm -hmm. tells you so much about it so i think like the way to approach it is which enemies like there's usually an enemy that you have to kill last because killing him will put you in a position where you're stuck yeah so you kind of know there and then working back from there it's usually kind of people solve it but sometimes there's multiple options which is where the, the complexity comes from mm -hmm. it's interesting to like, think about like what makes what makes a puzzle hard what makes a puzzle easy what makes it fun um yeah for me i really like the super tight puzzles i'll, I'll point out my favorite things. um i like the super small puzzles that are still challenging that have lots of choice yeah i i don't really like the big ones where you can like, navigate all over the place i think it just just takes time but kind of the reason i'm not crazy about these gravity flipping levels and mm -hmm. later the room flipping there's a lot of waiting for stuff to fall mm -hmm. and actually in the original pico 8 version um, you could move while stuff was falling, and it made it feel much more responsive. Yeah. Right, but it made it exploitable. You could do weird stuff. Yeah. 
It became almost an action game on some puzzles. You would push a block and then kind of run around and mm. uh, kind of beat it in some ways. Not quite that complex because everything moves at the same speed, so you can't actually outrun anything. But they're especially on the um, the clone levels later. There's a lot of like order of operations complexity where which witch move which witch. Um, does the purple witch move first or does the real witch move first and then yeah. move and then you can get in situations where you can kinda like float essentially across the screen because it thinks that there's still a block under you, but there's not because the other witch kept it and then you can land on the block with the other witch. Anyway. Um, so I had to take that out and make it so that everything falls lands, stops moving, and then you can move again, which yeah. the game feels slow at times, which I really am not crazy about. Um, but it's still better than Trap, which is the game this is kind of originally based on. I don't know if you saw that at all, but um, no. it's a Game Boy, game, Boy game. Actually, it's been on a whole bunch of stuff. Um, it, it was kind of the most basic version of this, where it's like the castle levels at the start where you just push blocks and cobwebs and stuff like that. There's no additional mechanics. They add a second player later on, but that's it. But anyway, um, in that one, you, each thing falls individually. So if you knock over, or if a stack of three blocks falls, it's like one block falls, then the next block falls, and then, and then you can move it. Compared to that, this is, this is pretty lightning quick. So, I can understand uh, why you got rid of being able to move to, because then it, it's a, like one of the first things I tried at first. Like, oh, can I move during this? Because if you didn't intend that and it was in there, like, uh, I think a lot of people would figure, oh, this is the way I have to solve the puzzle. I have to make sure I move while mm -hmm. the room is flipping. Yeah, yeah, I'm quite conscious of that. I and the boss, the final boss, which we'll see eventually, uh, it's a bit of a concession there, but. Mm -hmm. Um, I really didn't want it to ever not feel like a turn-based puzzle game. I didn't want there to be any mechanics where um, motor function is how you solve the puzzle. It should mm -hmm. always be something that you could solve on paper, if you know what I mean? Like, there's yeah. nothing... Um, you know, like, kind of weird sequence of events or timing-specific things. You should be able to look at a puzzle and solve it. So I made sure every puzzle mechanic follow that rule, and yeah, as you were saying, once you enter the realm of multiple things moving at the same time, it can screw that up. Sadly, like, it mostly didn't doesn't matter, and you can kind of get away with everything moving at the same time, because, mm. as I was saying, everything moves at the same time, so um, it ends up just working out, but it's really just the, the clone which screws everything up. Mm. So, uh, in this gravity, we're in chapter three, in this gravity flipping uh, world or segment, what, where, where is this in here? Are we in the mines? Where, where are we right now? This one I imagine as, um, like a, I don't know specifically where it is, but it's more of an event. So mm -hmm. I imagine it as an area of the. Uh, the castle or dungeon where mm. some spell went wrong and mm. it's just kind of ripped the fabric of space into it. and that's why okay. some, some the books are floating the walls are kind of being torn apart um yeah the fact that there's stone I don't know, you could maybe imagine that it was in, in a cellar in the lower parts but yeah the the key or the kind of the part I kind of focus on is the the idea that uh, yeah, something's gone wrong. This is mm. kind of a. This would be a place nobody goes anymore. You don't go. I anywhere. see. You don't know what's going to happen. People are walking on the ceilings. Books are floating. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like that. This is a tough puzzle. This is, this is a good one. This is one of those ones where I started with something really simple and just kept layering more and more onto it to, until it was like, complex enough that I felt it could end a section on. I do want something 
something quite challenging for the last puzzle. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's over. Oh, that was definitely mm -hmm. a puzzle. A bit of a bookend. Is that what helped you kind of arrange or make levels? Did you have a sequence for every chapter? You know, the the first level introduces the mechanic. The second level it gets a little bit more complex. By the third one, you got to handle the mechanic. And then, did you have a sequence for kind of every level in the chapter? Yeah. So the the overall vision for the difficulty curve was I I wanted it to be kind of an up and down. Mm -hmm. curve of difficulty so you'd have a spike in the chapter and then it would drop for the next chapter but overall the mechanics would get harder and harder uh, throughout the game but something I didn't want to do was mix mechanics I didn't want mm -hmm. it to be I don't know for some reason I don't like that mm -hmm. I feel like it's, it's I think it's too complex for me <laughs> maybe why I don't play puzzle games but Mm -hmm. I a lot of puzzle games, but I wanted it to feel more like little chunks mm -hmm. of the game rather than oh now I gotta do both of them. Like, to me, that feels overwhelming. I'm, yeah, which would be like this curve. This would be like kind of like a hockey stick, it would just skyrocket by the end. We'd have six mechanics all overlapping. Um, whereas I want it to be yeah, more of a, a dip and climb in that curve of difficulty. So that's kind of what I was going for. And then within a chapter. I would kind of take a guess at what I thought they were, and then playtesters would tell me if things were difficult. Mm. Well, during the uh, Nest Dev compo, some people, and, I, and the final one as well, but it wasn't as impactful. During the uh, Nest Dev compo, people would do full plays and time their each level, how long it took them in clock time, and then I'd map out like what was the most difficult, what was the easiest, and there was a couple big outliers that needed to be mm -hmm. um, tweaked. In this one, it was more like I was saying before, where I thought levels were really difficult, and they turned out to be really easy, and I had to go back and add complexity. Yeah, we kind of skipped, or we didn't skip, but while I was talking there, we did the mirror sequence, which is like my favorite. I was really proud of that. <laughs> the the fade in and everything and the visual it's really really cool i like that yeah it's pretty like it's it's simple compared to what most people do in the scene for mm -hmm. special effects but for me it was kind of my first time doing something mm -hmm. beyond just the basics i guess um, doing something that isn't obvious maybe exactly how it's done there's some kind of tricks to it so yeah i was super happy with that and then this uh, this section is also from the as I mentioned the, the comp and the Pico A version. This um, clone clone witch. I think this is the the chapter probably I struggled the most with with getting uh, getting the solutions to the, to the levels. Mm. Yeah, they're tricky. The, the, last the, most. the last one was one of those ones that that uh, got, was like the outlier. I was yeah. watching it and I got when we did the NSF combo. It was just a killer. And that one was crazy because that was... Uh, so these levels are based on the Pico 8 version. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't realize it, but the Pico 8 version, the original solution to that puzzle relies on one of those exploits I was talking about. Mm kind of hover across the screen and I, I didn't realize it and I spent I don't know probably not that long but what felt like eternity trying to solve that puzzle because I went back to it trying to re-implement it in the NES and I just couldn't beat it what how did I do this and then eventually I went and found an old video of a streamer playing the Pico Wave mm -hmm. and saw how he did it and I thought, oh it's it's an exploit so I had to change that level mm -hmm. slightly for the NES version to not require you know, Hover across the game. That one gets people a lot too. That's one of those ones I really like. It's simple, there's not mm -hmm. like a ton of choices, but for some reason it's very hard to you know, put two and two together. This one this is one of my least favorite puzzles. It's so like 
There's no real trick to it. You kind of just walk forward and eventually you'll solve it. There's not, there's not a lot you can do to go wrong beyond dropping down too early. Yeah. So, this one's kind of neat. It's interesting too when I when you, once you once I know the solution, it seems like the clues are there. Like how like there's those two bats. There's no way to get those other than having two people stacked on top of each other. Yeah. So like, no, that's supposed to like clue you in, but for whatever reason, that's one of those things that. People's minds don't immediately go to them. Yeah. I mean, I guess technically you could imagine stacking up the blocks or something. Maybe there's enough blocks there to do that if, if you somehow got the two from the back. I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. Like, there's so many blocks up there that it makes you think. Yeah. Hmm, there's a block solution to this. Yeah. I like this one for that. <laughs> Yeah, this level's supposed to be mirrors all over the place. I would have liked to add some kind of reflection effect to sell that a bit more. <laughs> way to do it with what I have. So when I is, struggle, yeah, sorry, go ahead. This is the this is one I my first playthrough I really struggled with, and I think I sent you a message and be like I am so stuck in this one, and I had to step away from it for a day and come back to it. <laughs> this is the one that required the exploit. Oh, so okay. that's, that's the hard part, like because I it is a it is a tough puzzle. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, what am I not getting? I'm trying to solve my own puzzle. And yeah. Eventually realizing it's impossible. But yeah, this is this is probably I think this is probably the toughest puzzle in the game, which is unfortunate. You know, if the last puzzle in the game was the toughest, but. Yeah, it's one. There's a lot of choices here, which makes it difficult. Yeah, like at the end, I always knew where I had to be, but I, I initially I just couldn't see how to do it. Mm -hmm. So, but stepping away, you know, I don't know how we're supposed to puzzles, but sometimes I have to just step away and I come back, and then the solution just seems obvious, or it was just there, like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tough too. One thing I don't like about this in the puzzles in general is if you can make a decision early on that just makes it impossible to solve. Mm -hmm. So in this case, um, oh, I thought you were about to solve it. Um, <laughs> and negate everything. Oh wait, are you about to solve it in a different way? Oh, you are. Okay, never mind. I was just, just solved it a different way. I was gonna say you have to push the block over the side at the start, but you don't. Right. Another one of your uh, uh, between the chapter sequences, really cool, with the flashing and the breaking of um, the orb. Yeah, I got to do the shatter sound effects. Those were kind of cheap ones because I ran out of like art for mm -hmm. things. I think originally I imagined that one was going to be a giant wrench or something. So the idea here is the the shaft going through the center of the screen is meant to be a, a pivot point. Mm -hmm. So every time you press A, the idea, mm -hmm. which is kind of very Castlevania, the whole room is kind of flipping over, leaving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you imagine like you jump and the, the room flips. That was, that was the idea. Um, yeah, this one I would have really liked to get some sort of screen flipping, screen rotation effect in. Oh yeah. Especially watching other people play. It's quite disorienting. Mm. Uh, it's just so instant, it just flashes black and suddenly everything's changed. Uh, yeah, which I, I could have probably done. Some people pointed out ways I could uh, do it, but it was just a little beyond me. Mm -hmm. I tried to not do stuff uh, that I don't understand how it works. Because eventually it'll come back to bite me, there'll be a bug in there and I won't be able to, mm. to fix it. So I try not to take like code handouts too much. I'd rather just do it a dumb way that I understand rather than a clever way that somebody else comes up with. This was one this was one of the ones that I, I 
I watched people play and I just had no idea what I was thinking, why, how this was going to be difficult at all. You, originally, you could just literally walk across and kill that bird. Um, so. Really? Because like, I, I know every time I know this, every time I play it, I'm like, this is probably a very simple puzzle. But for every reason, my mind is like, I can't. <laughs> no, so now it's difficult. I mean, in like mm -hmm. the early beta. Oh, it okay. Was, it was like just a block, like where you're standing now. Mm -hmm. You just pushed it over and walked around. <laughs> <laughs> or it was up top or something. So now, it, yeah, this is one where, to me, this really kind of breaks the brain a bit, where mm -hmm. flipping over and over again results in you moving and things changing. Yeah. you kind of think of it as, and especially after the gravity levels, just pressing A over and over again should kind of just yeah. reset you back to where you were, but it actually like slowly leapfrogs you further and further out and gets you out of it. Yeah, I don't like this level at all. Though. This was... This is one where... I don't know what's challenging about this. You just go to no choices. Or it should have been an earlier level. a little reprieve before this one. This one's pretty Well, you're a little too hard on yourself. I, I enjoy it <laughs> most of all. Oh. Yes. Yeah, sometimes I need to like um, remember that people want the feeling of mm -hmm. it's harding the game sometimes. It's not fun to constantly be beaten down. So having mm -hmm. a level that's unexpectedly easy here and there is not the worst thing. I just don't like when there's nothing clever or unique about it. It goes back to your, your initial, what you were saying, you know, after a difficult level to give the player, uh, you know, a breather or accomplishment that kind of engages you so you're not, like you're saying, not constantly being beaten down, like that you kind of have a um, reward um, for you feel accomplished, and then it's a little breather, and then you have to challenge yourself again. Yeah. Kind of goes into even when you end the level and you get that level complete, dancing, text, joyous music. Like, yeah. imagine if that wasn't there. Like, it's such a, a maybe not, I wouldn't say a little thing, but it has a big impact on pushing you to keep going. If you didn't have that, I don't know, you might might wear you down, you know, if you make it that little dance. Yeah. Yeah, that music is supposed to be uh, reminiscent of the Final Fantasy 3 or 7 mm -hmm. level up music. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, yeah. That's, well, I don't know if it was in 3, but that's in 7. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's kind of what I was asking for for that. Deliver. Yeah, this one's tricky too, because... Um, after you flip and then climb the ladder, it kind of changes where you end up in this pod you are now. Where yeah. It's up, like on the bottom instead of falling to the end of this way. So it, it seems impossible, which I really like. I like that <laughs> you can look at this and think that's absolutely impossible. There's no way to kick that out. But if you do it first, right here, yeah, it's on the roof. <clears throat> it's not, at least to me, obvious why it was that time, but not the first time. And it's because you like cross over your you cross yeah. over that threshold where the rotation is now. And that whole rotation is quite, to me anyway, mind-bending where like you can never get up through mm -hmm. the rotation. You're always staying at the same level. And it can feel like, oh, I'll teleport up to this top part. But you're actually teleporting the top part down. And it you know, breaks the brain a little bit. Yeah, it is a mind bender. I didn't <laughs> quite get it, the mechanic, until you kind of explained it. And now I can kind of see... Now that I'm looking at it and still playing it, you can see the gear rotations or the spinning. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't imagine this rotation, you know? Once I can take a step back and look at it now, now I can understand and see it. I really should have got the, at least once, show like that the, the room mm -hmm. was rotating, even if it was just a one-off special effect or something. But... Hmm. It's too late now, man. Why are you telling me this? 
<laughs> it's in it, it's this goes into like even when you get feedback from from beta testers or players and everything like you can't rely on one person like because this, this might have been my comment but anyone else been like yeah i i could see it totally you know mm. yeah yeah i might be the minority in this one <laughs> no i think that's pretty valid yeah this was another one that was uh this was this mechanic was also quite challenging because the uh the mapper I'm using, well, probably. Ch anyway, the way I, I like, you can't rotate or mm -hmm. flip the background like that, so I had to duplicate all of the mm. background images, which isn't super. That's just kind of time, but then all the logic to kind of lay the level out needs to flip them, but needs to flip them like within themselves as well, like the meta tiles. So it, it got pretty gross. And then on top of that, the enemies need to flip, and the sprites for when things move, they move from the background to the sprite layer. Mm -hmm. Sprites need to flip as well. So. That sounds but like a, a programming nightmare. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't like a total nightmare, but it's just something small, like that. The end result isn't super aggressive. But it, a lot of time goes into making it work. I remember you posting something on Twitter. Uh, I think it was Twitter. It might have been on in the brewery to work out something, and it was it was in your prologue, and you wanted um, a certain sequence. I think of the the, the character that you're chasing to 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 fall on the screen, and it was some sort of it was a challenge. Yeah. Um, I guess something like that, like something that you. From an outsider, it seems very, oh, that's easy. It should do it, but it's actually quite a bit of a challenge. Yeah, I think it was dealing with like black fades mm. between scenes and having the players move. Oh, yeah. During that sequence, so that it it looked as if the player had been moving prior to. Yeah. Moving. Otherwise, you get to the screen and it's like a bit of a Truman Show moment where everyone's holding positions and then the fade oh yeah that was it <laughs> yeah it breaks the immersion quite dramatically it, it's such a small thing but it yeah it's really noticeable when it's there the black and just black fades in general if the popping versus smoothly smoothly fading is this the last one I think this is the last level of this one. yeah it is we're on I think you always end on a 10 I think it's not totally consistent. Originally mm. that was the goal, but I opted to not put in any, although I complained about them, but in general I've tried not to put in any puzzles that I wasn't happy with mm. to focus on quality over quantity. This one, this is one of those cases where you spend a lot of time waiting for that block to fall back and forth. It would have mm. been nice to get it a little tighter. That's what, originally I didn't have that shadow and stuff like the one you just did was quite challenging without knowing where you're going to. Oh, uh, yeah. And that one becomes significantly easier. So this is my favorite mechanic in the game. Some people don't like it. I was very surprised. Oh, uh, with with the picking up the key and moving yeah. the key and everything? Okay. Yeah, I like, I really like how it's um, very basic. It's mm -hmm. kind of kind of goes back to the original version of the game where it's really just pushing blocks, mm -hmm. destroying cobwebs, killing enemies, but it adds a little twist to that without completely changing things like gravity or the second effect. So yeah, I, I really like it. And when you get in a good rhythm, to me, it can start to feel like a bit of an action. Picking up the mm -hmm. or not jumping. Yeah. There is a there is more of a challenge with the key because it depends on where you're facing too. So you can end up in a situation like if you suddenly turn or something. Oh, I can't solve it now. 
you know, yeah. like it adds another element of challenge. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of little things like that with it. I feel like it's a nuanced um, mechanic as opposed to the other ones, which are a bit more flashy, um, change things up dramatically. This, yeah, it has a lot of little pieces to it. The way you're facing, um, being able to pick it up from underneath, throwing it on top of other things, using it as a platform. It's a very versatile mechanic. It's really fun to design puzzles. And I copied the uh, animation from Super Mario Bros. 2. To pick up. Although it's probably changed now after Al did it, but originally it was quite pleased with this. So, uh, it's in this chapter is the mechanic that I forgot I could do, and I'll point out the level. It's, I'm wondering now, because my favorite puzzle is in this level. I'm wondering if it's any more. <laughs> this is one of my favorites, but this one really lives in that wheelhouse I mentioned earlier of a really yeah. compact area. Um, but within that area, there's quite a few choices, quite a few things to go wrong, including stuff like you mentioned, just facing the wrong way and then you can yeah. hack it. I think I do it right here. I'm, I'm going to be facing yeah. the wrong Yep. Yeah, so when you that's why that space on the left is there. Um, which is something I I considered not having. Adding the ability to just rotate. Mm -hmm. But it felt really slow for one. To like have to press right twice to move from left to right. Um, I'm sure I could have probably solved it better with oh yeah. <laughs> um, so this uh, I don't know if I showed it before, but you have a undo uh, right, command. Yeah. So yeah. How do, you, how do you come to the conclusion to, to put that in? And this might tie up to a, a larger conversation about your accessibility, uh, mm -hmm. uh, things you put in. We can talk at the end about, about that, but what drove you to kind of put the undo in, into a move set? Um, I think like the initial reason is the Game Boy game I mentioned at the start could trap mm -hmm. has an undo, which is like really impressive if you ever get a chance to look at it. It does a full, like reverse animation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really cool. And I can figure out how to do that. But, uh, so I think that's kind of the catalyst for why I even thought about it. But certainly, I really don't like puzzle games where you make a tiny mistake and yeah. somebody to do the whole thing over again. Especially with mechanics you were just showing. Like you, just now, in that key level, you had faced the wrong way. Yeah. You would have to do that whole puzzle again, where it's a quick B press and that's yeah. So, I, yeah, I don't think it's, it's not really true to the puzzle to force you to redo stuff for unintentional mistakes. Mm -hmm. So, I think an undo it makes a lot of sense because sometimes you do something unintentionally, you just hit the key or you hit the the D pad unintentionally, stuff like that. So. I think it's fine to let people say, oops, didn't need to do that. Yeah. It doesn't solve it for you. Hopefully people don't use it to like redo the level, because that's why the select button is there to instantly redo it. I think that's a better experience. But yeah, I think mean, it makes sense. There's not a lot of areas where you want to kind of test every possible scenario and then like you couldn't really exploit it very well that way, I don't think anyway. Yeah. I mean, like some games, like Prince of Persia or Forza or whatever, you can kind of just retry a, a turn over and over and over again until you get it perfect. That's a bit of an exploit, which I'm not crazy about, but here it really is just controls. Me. I made a mistake. I don't, I don't picture people exploiting it that much. Yeah. Um, but it was quite challenging to implement for me. And on the nest dev one, I had to limit it to one undo, which is mm -hmm. quite painful. It's almost like a tease, because you'll often like, jump forward twice and go, oops, and then oh, I can only go back one minute. Was so that a technical limitation, why you can only have one undo? Because yeah, it was like, well, yeah, it was beyond my technical capabilities. Mm -hmm. Just memory. The uh, 
the Action 52 card doesn't have the working RAM. Hmm. So it just have the two kilobytes that's on the system, which the code used almost all of it already, so uh, saving saving the moves that you've done goes in that RAM as well. So yeah, I only have room for one for one move. I think I, like you could obviously optimize things. Uh, I'm sure there would have been clever ways to just remember inputs, something yeah. like that, and then kind of work it out. But I couldn't figure out a way to do it. So, and I knew that I had a solution that did work mm -hmm. with the full version. Does hundred and something moves? So I, I, didn't, I didn't worry about it too much. But I do think it's. It makes the game quite a bit more enjoyable, personally. So I kind of I try to highlight that feature, but it's hard to make it sound exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it it does help because you, you naturally will make a like a, a button uh, mispress or something, and you have the solution down. You might even be going towards the solution, and it was just like, oh, why did I make that one mistake? You know. Especially the bigger puzzles. Yeah. This one, this puzzle is interesting. I don't know if you caught it, but it's a it's a repeat of an earlier puzzle mm. uh, from the the first area, first chapter. But there's actually a couple of them in here in the key area where adding the key kind of dramatically changes things. And the solution that you do in the first one won't work anymore, mm. even though it's basically the same layout. Yeah, I didn't pick up that it was uh, the same puzzle, or That's good. similar puzzle, yeah. It gives me a free puzzle. <laughs> so, yeah, um, like where you kind of remember mm -hmm. what to do, but not exactly. Yeah. No, you think so? I might un I might restart <laughs> it. <laughs> Be like, this isn't working. <laughs> this requires yeah thinking of things across multiple kind of layers and steps. So are we, um, where are we? Are we in the sewer right now? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, sewer, which is the same tile set as the dungeon, but I tried to uh, only do water in the sewer, mm -hmm. and only do uh, the cave prison doors in the mm -hmm. dungeon to make it feel, and obviously the pallet swap, but make it feel a little unique. There, I finally got through it. <laughs> oh, this is it. This is my favorite. Puzzle. Okay. This is another repeat. Okay. And this one is identical to the original, which is why I think I like it. Identical except adding that key there. Mm -hmm. um, which just... Like that's that's getting pretty like inside baseball because I'm playing this game all the time. So mm -hmm. to me, it's very clever that making that one little change dramatically yeah. change this because I know that other and that other level was in the original version. So I've been staring at it for five years now. So to me, it feels very clever. <laughs> <laughs> this minor little change dramatically switches things up. But, yeah. and it's very tight. There's not a lot of dead time of just walking around or waiting for them. Yeah. Uh, oh, picking up the key there becomes like an elevator. It's something I don't do very much. This is the level. Yeah. I forget that you can... Or I don't, I don't know, you could swap the key and another tile, and I like just go around this thing and around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is a weird... So yeah, that, that feedback came up actually during the mm -hmm. beta. So in the I added in the second or third level of this section was a part 
I force the part where the key is on top of you and there's a block on top of that. Yeah. And you have to throw it and the block falls down. And after someone else said the exact same thing, that it's not, it's not, even if it's maybe like logical, mm -hmm. never do it anywhere else. So yeah. that in the final puzzle out of nowhere is a bit much. And this one, ex this is one of those like clever, no, I mean, clever's the wrong word, but salt, so, yeah, you just did it. So the blocks, when they go over a door, mm -hmm. Break it. So if you put, if there was a gap to the right of the door, mm -hmm. if you block off, the door would be gone forever. Mm. And I ran into that bug very late in the beta. And so rather than fix the bug, I just made sure everywhere there's a door, yeah, there's a solid wall beside it, so that you can never get it off of the door. Mm -hmm. so that's one of those cost benefit things where is fixing that really going to make the game better, or just not letting you ever. So, um, what made you like all the um, sprites on the screen? The enemies, they all they all have movement to it. Is that something that was always there, or you decided that was that was important at, at some point in the in the game? Um, that comes from the original Pico Eight version, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and also from the Game Boy game it was inspired by it had the same thing. And it's it kind of fits naturally in here because the uh, MMC1 mapper can switch between character sets, uh, mm -hmm. sprites, instantaneous with, a, with almost no effort and no uh, performance hit, so it makes it really easy to do uh, animations that way, but the downside is that it uses up tons of character memory because you basically have to duplicate the sprite and do a tiny switch. So that's why it's the, the very coarse two frame animation mm -hmm. in kind of a um, rhythmic. So it limits what you can do, but um, kind of like that water falling is just mm -hmm. that, it's just awesome. Yeah, it's for two like that's two frames of animation of those men. So he, yeah, he did a good job of what, what he has. I'm sure it was frustrating to work with, but um, technically it was, it was quite nice to work with. And yeah, same with the flames. Like, I think they they pass half decent. And if you're on CRT, I think it works even better. Yeah, every, everything is very graphically very well, well polished everything movement dancing things in the background is you, you could have easily just had black backgrounds with all the blocks and the puzzles in front of it and kind of called it a day but you went you went extra to to show this this level of polish and it's it's very nice thank you like even like the sunlight coming through the cell window above you know yeah, I really like it. Like, that's all kind of, but I love it too. <laughs> as a, as a yeah, fan myself, some of the stuff. It's really fun to work with people who are kind of surprising you with the stuff they send over. And help as well. Yeah, I'm pre like another minor thing, I'm pretty happy with the little particle effects that come off the bottom of the, yeah. the uh, blocks, and when you go down there on the ladder, just little things that I think weren't done that often in NES era, license era. A little bit of a modern touch. So, do you, do you look to, to mostly modern games for these type of polished influences, or do you look back at some of the NES era for um, influence, or, or or just looking back at it to see like, oh, this is what was done. That was a cool move. Sorry, it's <laughs> not before. That was neat. Um, should have made a puzzle around it. But uh, I'd say it's a mix. Like, there's, I, I mentioned it earlier about like the magical items. And mm -hmm. It's kind of asymmetrical. I really love how during the NES era, a lot of things were still being figured out. 
and there weren't kind of the clear-cut rules. The boss takes three hits, and yeah, how many items, you know, how many of these artifacts are you going to find before the end of the game, and stuff. Um, so I, I like that kind of stuff in its quirkiness, but I do believe that things need to be. There's an expectation of playability that wasn't there back then. Yeah, the idea of completing a game to me when I was a kid was pretty far out there. Uh, I just want to mention here the uh, the statues in the background are all other game. Mm. The uh, from below tentacle is a guy from uh, a game out worked on, and then. Uh, the, the original Witch and Wiz sprites are all statues. That was supposed to be like the Anarnia mm -hmm. thing, where the sorcerer, the dark sorceress, has all these statues of her victims that she's using for dark magic. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, but back to your question. Uh, yeah, I like. I think. I don't know. I think there's room for all of it. Personally, at least with this game, I want it to feel modern. Uh, probably more than retro mm -hmm. in some ways. I, I'm not really looking to make a esoteric, kind of quirky game with this. I want it to be playable, I want people to feel familiar. I think expectations that, yeah, you can complete the game without a walkthrough, that the translation isn't totally bonkers and stuff like that. I <laughs> don't want to do that with this. Um, but I do think I would like to explore some of those other things more with other games, especially just breaking some norms, challenging uh, challenging expectations a bit, uh, breaking conventions. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of look at them both, and certainly like graphically, there's things like the the two frame animation. Mm -hmm. To me, like that looks like Super Mario Bros. Three. Mm -hmm. The overworld. Although I think there it's more from some animation, but that kind of like rhythmic animation, you probably wouldn't do that in a modern game because it looks a little weird, but to me it's a little nostalgic. Hmm. Palette swap stuff. Like back in the day, that stuff drove me crazy playing Final Fight, and this is a new enemy. He's green now. <laughs> <laughs> That's obviously the same guy. Yeah. Uh, but, but here, there's a bit of. For me, to stop it. I don't want to do too much of it. I don't want. To, I want yeah. to use it as a crutch where I'm doing it because I can't do anything else. I want it to be a choice. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that a question. Yeah. But yeah, this is an example. This is the same tile set, but purple now. <laughs> oh, and I broke my rule. There's water down there. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you can see, you can kind of get a hint of it. It's not super obvious, but there's these arching uh, doorways that are meant to be like, behind the wizard. They're meant to be dungeons to all the all the victims of the, the sorceress are in here somewhere. Some of them in bar or something. And again, yeah. So for the final section, the final chapter of the game. Um, this is back to the original Pico 8 levels mm -hmm. in the nest of although it looks dramatically different. But yeah, this, so this mechanic is from uh, Katrap or Pippin. Okay. Which is like the first half of the game is one character and the second half of the game is two characters in that game. Just cool, like it's fun, but I kind of want to take a different angle where things are constantly changing, and hopefully it yeah. feels fresh um, as opposed to a, a longer term like, master the puzzle mechanic. This is one puzzle of the week kind of mm -hmm. feel. see the dungeon doors a little bit. Yeah. 
How, how did you go through and pick all the different abilities per chapter? Um, so you have, the, you have the key, you have the, the mirror flip, um, you have these duplic uh, the two characters. Yep. How did you go through and, and pick which ones to do? Um, yeah, so I did a bunch on paper. I, actually, all of them designed on paper, and I would essentially try to design a simple level, a medium difficulty level, and a really, really hard puzzle with each mechanic on paper. Which is actually pretty hard, because a lot of it is um, like trying things and saying, like, oh, if I put a block there, that would mm -hmm. make this harder. But anyway, I tried to do that with all the mechanics I came up with. And then if I couldn't come up with a hard puzzle, and definitely if I can't come up with a medium puzzle on paper, I kind of abandoned it because I knew it was going to be like, really challenging to come up with 10 puzzles if, that, if I can't even come up with one. Yeah. That was kind of an initial litmus test. And then... Um, if it passed that first test, I would also consider what would it take to implement this and what would it feel like. So one of the ideas I had was uh, two similar ones. One was lava, like flowing through that would be mm -hmm. essentially you can it would become a wall. Mm -hmm. You can't walk into lava, so there'd be these streams of waterfalls of lava. But you could put blocks in front of them and that would redirect the lava. Mm. So there's some cool puzzles with that, but quite complex to implement and probably very slow feeling because you move something and you'd have to wait for the lab to mm. reach its destination and then do it, move again. So that's why that one didn't make it out of uh, the paper phase. And similarly, I had one with water where there were jets of water, which I liked because it added a verticality, or sorry, like an upward momentum, which the game mm -hmm. lacks for the most part, because you can never move a block up. Like yeah. It's always moving down. You can climb ladders, but you can't jump, you can't climb off stuff, so I like that aspect of it, but I just couldn't come up with enough meaningful puzzles. And it, again, it would be quite difficult to implement. I was thinking of stuff where you would like block one geyser in the next mm -hmm. one. One next to it would go. Oh, up, okay, yeah. Stuff like that. So it would just work like a, a lever system, which is pretty cool, but it would have meant a lot to pull that off. So, so I abandoned Stuck with what I thought was fit. Like the gravity one is a nice one because it's essentially the same game, mm -hmm. just gravity pushing you up. Uh, I thought the teleport one. Would be similar. It turned out to be more complex than that. That was that was the thought process. Mm. Yeah, yeah. A lot, like a lot of the decisions are around how hard is it to design puzzles for these? Because I'm not, I'm not really, as I mentioned, a puzzle guy. Mm -hmm. so I struggled a lot, to be honest, just to come up with the hundred or so levels here. I don't know how they do one of these games with one mechanic and there's a hundred levels. It's, it's wild to me, but uh, I kind of, yeah, that's part of the reason I went with lots of different mechanics as opposed to lots of puzzles with the same mechanic. It's, mm -hmm. it's a bit easier, that ramp up, you only need two or three really challenging puzzles. The simple puzzles are super easy to design, and the medium ones are pretty easy. It's, it's just the... Yeah. I get that. Yeah. It was a, a, a good choice to kind of speed along, you know, one, the development, and two, the enjoyment and everything of, of the game to have these different abilities to center around the puzzle. And it makes sense of why you kind of left it as each puzzle is, is based around your, your ability rather than kind of mixing them all together. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I did actually originally I planned to have... Um, I forget what it's called. In, you know in Super Mario World, there's like the outrageous zone like above Star World, you know what I'm talking about? There are like eight really challenging uh, levels after you complete Oh, Super yeah. Mario. Okay. I forget what yeah, it's called. You said in Super Mario World? Yeah. I think it's I'm called like, Star Road. Star Road, yeah. Um, I wanted to do that where 
a couple of the levels would have secret exits. Yeah. And if you found them, they would go to a zone where mm. I did combine the elements, and I would just do eight mm. or so levels of that, where you kind of explore that for the kind of an end game. Yeah. Thing, but I just didn't have time. So yeah, we're at the final boss. So this was a bit of a concession for me. Um, I really wanted... The game really lacked a climax or a feeling. Mm -hmm. It just ended before and you finished that last puzzle you just did and the credits. But I really wanted something that made you feel that you accomplished something that was kind yeah. of good to the, the game. Um, and uh, yeah, I I really didn't want it to turn into an action game. I wanted people who loved the first ninety nine percent of the game to yeah. play the boss fight as well, and for it to feel like the culmination of the skills they gained. But that's very difficult with puzzle game because other than just making a really really hard puzzle at the end, which I could do as well, um, I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. But, to make that feel like different and exciting, so yeah, the, the idea um, I think this was actually suggested by Tui, the, the musician. Um, the idea we came up with was have five relatively simple puzzles back to back, but with a time constraint. Yeah. So if you stop to think about it, like that puzzle, dead simple, but it's really easy just to kill the ghost of the right. Stuff. So the idea is you're kind of going through these five levels in sequence. If you fail a level, run out of time, like here, and you move back one level. So it's a bit of like cat and mouse as you try to complete these five levels. Um, so it's a soft failure. You can't really die or get a mm -hmm. game or anything like that. The worst you're going to run into is waste of time. So I, I kind of feel like it's okay. And I added something to the options so that you can turn off the time. Yeah, it was it. It was really smart. It it comes out as a good culmination of the game, mm -hmm. so I, I really liked it. It was a really smart move. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy with it. There's some kind of mixed feelings I think on it from the beta testers, but I feel like it's I need something there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, otherwise, you have kind of an abrupt end. You know, like yeah. if the et levels just ended, like. It's too abrupt, you know. Either you end up with this scenario where you you plan kind of like a, a boss fight level sequence, or you'd end up having to do similar to the prologue. You'd have to plan some sort of acted cut scene that you're like reunited, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's one thing I really wish I got in there was the the wizard was supposed to be like hanging from a rope or something, being lowered mm -hmm. into lava. It said he's just not there. Um. Yeah, and then the credit sequence, so this is obviously like a throwback to Super Mario World, Super Mario 2, maybe. Yeah. Being enemies, giving them all names, my daughters, and all <laughs> and send them, pay them, and then, uh, yeah, and then that's them there. Abigail, Eliana, those are my two daughters, and this is my And then a bunch of people who helped out with the game in the special thanks section. Nice. Hmm. That's the end. <laughs> oh yeah, and then one thing, I don't know if it's in the video here. Um, I wanted to add like some recognition of completing the game, so when you go back to the mm -hmm. the press start screen, the, the main character uh, kind of animates through a rainbow of colors. Hmm. Which I like from... Uh, I think Mario Kart 64 did that, a couple other okay. games, but you just changed the title screen. Actually, I think maybe all the Mario games did that, at least the later ones. But anyway, just a little. I wanted to do more, like maybe a fireworks or something, but yeah. that's one of those things where the cost-benefit is, is tough to justify. You know? Yeah. I also wanted to make it so that uh, on the start screen, when you press start, it freezes on one color, just, mm -hmm. just naturally does that. But I wanted to make it so that whichever color you freeze on, the witch will be that color if you mm. play through, but just ran out of time. That's it. That's uh that's interesting. And um I'm not talking about another game in here, but that something kinda like what Brad did with Lizard where it randomly select colors and everything. It's really yeah. 
it's an interesting, interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. There we had it. That was uh, that was the game, Witch and Wiz. Um, so we're on the eve of the public pre-order of your game. How do you feel? Uh, pretty excited, actually. Kind of very anxious. It's actually launching a week early, and I'm wondering how I would have survived another week of like the anxiety of the launch. So, yeah, I'm pretty excited to kind of just get it out there, be able to show everybody kind of like the game itself has been somewhat public for a while with the beta and everything but all of the card and the box and uh, the pack-in stuff so i'm excited to kind of share everything finally that's great um so way in the beginning when we started recording um the trailer it shows all these options that it's going to be released on you can get it digitally you can get it physically you can get it on pie packer um, I want to talk a minute about the physical uh, publishing of it. It's going through limited run games. Um, how, how did that come about? What, where did you approach them? Um, did they approach you? How was that arrangement? No, I uh, I basically reached out to everybody I could kind of think of the obvious people like within the homebrew community, and then yeah, some of the ones like limited run outside of kind of the core community and just um everyone was like super receptive way more than i expected um so yeah like just kind of heard what what they do they're all like different they're actually it's not as cut and dry as i thought it would be it's very kind of asymmetrical some people are excel at one thing less at others so um i kind of just heard them all out um and then i chose limited run um Mostly because, uh, one, I'm not sure if I'll ever get the opportunity again. It seems like kind of a, um, I don't know, they don't do a lot of NES games. So I'm kind of thinking, yeah, I should take a crack at it while I can. And they have just a huge audience, which I'm hoping to kind of tap into with the game to get outside of the, the core homebrew community. So, yeah, I basically just reached out, replied, went back and forth a whole bunch, and then... Uh, eventually settled on a yeah the package that's 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 great and i wonder um how it's going to feel on, on your end because like if you did um kickstarter or something there's the whole lead up to the campaign and the then the seeing how the campaign's going and i wonder how that's going to be uh, with women run with the open pre-order for this month is it is going to be exhilarating it's going to be like a lot of conversation going back and forth it's it's going to be interesting you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm. Yeah, I don't know what it's going to be like. It is. I think expectations are a little different than Kickstarter, where you're yeah. kind of, um, almost putting on a show for a month, and I think people prep a lot of content ahead of time. Yeah. They're not really planning anything like that, so which is maybe a bad idea. I should probably treat it the same, but um, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of just thinking. I'm thinking of it just as a normal pre-order, like I did with From Below, except. Mm -hmm. There's no like race to the finish. Everybody who wants it will have time to get it. And uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm hoping for back and forth. I'm like stuff like this video will come out um, for this podcast. I'm hoping to do like an AMA or something on the NES subreddit stuff like that. So hopefully I'll have a little bit of interaction along the way. Not sure. Cool. Uh, well, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Like. Uh excited to see you over the next month um before we we talk a little bit more actually let's let's tip, take a step back and take a look at some of the development of it um i have some uh photos to kind of show the development um that you shared with me um so let's 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 take a look at them cool yeah let's... so I, I have up on the screen i have um the title screen and this is the the final version that ended up in uh the game but i have a, a series of a couple of development ones next seeing if um if you can talk a little bit about it yeah these were all done by uh haller zoltan the artist who um yeah worked on the game worked on from below as well um and this was us just kind of iterating on the concept from scratch basically this one i like this one but i felt like the 
the wizard looked like a little bit too like a like a dunce hat, like, a little too dopey. Uh, but I really liked the idea of having the witch and the wizard there together, which is they're, they're very in a very minor way in the final one. I don't you can't really see it's hard to see, but the wizards in the tower in the top right there silhouette yeah. of the moon. But uh, yeah, we kind of lost that, which is a little unfortunate considering it's called witch and wiz. It's pretty seems obvious that you should have both of them, but yeah. Mm. This one just didn't quite make it. Yeah, I guess, but in, in a way, it's kind of like Witch and Wiz. The characters are, the names are both on the screen, and then one's absent, and it's replaced by this 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 uh, uh, dungeon in there. So that kind of sets up a little bit of story too. Yeah, I guess it's, it might be a little bit of a, in a compromise because what you initially thought, but uh, it might have worked out for for better. Yeah, you're right. And it, it's not like a uh, a co op game or something like that. Yeah. Dale or something like that. So, yeah, you're right. It does. Okay, I'm sold. I like the. I like <laughs> and on the other extreme, we have this other one where um, there's no witch, no whiz, and it's the castle and this uh, viney thorn, I guess. Yeah, which, yeah, looking at it, it probably doesn't make a ton of sense. But originally, when we were concepting the the game and kind of the world. I was picturing the um, the area that all the puzzles mm-hmm. take place. That tower was surrounded by thorns and bramble, kind of a Sleeping Beauty um, idea. So that's what those thorns are meant to be. That was the kind of wrapping around the tower. But yeah, I think it is a little too cold. Mm-hmm. Like, it's missing the charm and the character. It feels very like yeah, Dungeons and Dragons. A little too dark for me. Yeah, but that's probably my how you arrived at the last one. Those two title screens both had elements that ended up in, in uh, yeah. the last one, you know? Yeah, I don't remember the exact conversation, but it was probably something like, oh, I like the witch and I like the tower. And yeah. We kind of iterated on that, I'm guessing, but I don't remember exactly. But yeah, that would have been way back uh, before even the Nestev competition mm-hmm. built. Because the title screen in that build and the final game are essentially the same. Mm. So up next, um, we're taking a look at the cabin scene in the in in the final game. Um, but you also you had a, a development image um, uh, early on the cabin. Uh, yeah. Really yeah. scaled down, but. Um, as far as size, but also, it, I guess you're kind of doing a mock-up here of, of what, what what you were thinking in your head. Well, this one, I think, is from the artist, if I remember correctly. Mm. Um, obviously, like, not even close to final, but getting some of the concepts down. Compared to the orig- or the final one, you can see that we, have been, we went more with a, uh, like, Final Fantasy RPG style, mm-hmm. where when you're inside the house, you can't see the exterior. Just mm-hmm. to simplify things, because I think it gets a little weird when you can see like the proportions of everything. You have to kind of yeah. get a little bit more precise, whereas when it's just darkness outside, you can be a little bit more uh, liberal with the scale and stuff like that. Yeah, so here I think we were just like figuring out what elements there would be. Fireplace is in the final one. Bed. In this case, they have a door, more like a, a cave entrance, and we'd replace mm-hmm. that with a a hinged door. Um, the moon, I think, partially got used in the end. I think we ended up with a half moon in the exterior, not for the interior. But yeah, kind of all the pieces are there, but it's it's funny to see like how how much it changes uh, at the end. But yeah, all the pieces are there. Chimney. Yeah. Um. Okay, now we're taking a look at after the title screen. Uh, this is the uh, file select screen. I'm um, kind of had a percentage breakdown and where you are in the game, but in the development, um, you kind of showed this choose a floor sequence. Did you have um, something else in mind uh, where you can kind of go? It, it's a series of steps of where you are in, in the game as you progress. Yeah, this was a pitch by. Uh... Sultan, which his idea was that, um, so th- this would be more, actually, this would be less kind of the save slot select. It mm-hmm. would be more the, after you complete the game, you can pick mm. 
specific level. And the idea here was that as the levels got more difficult, it would show more ghosts to kind of represent this is a harder and harder level. Mm -hmm. But I was pretty adamant about with so many levels, having a little preview of what you're going to play. Pretty important to me. Yeah. Um, which it's not a lot. You just get a little kind of window into the level, but it's enough to maybe spark spark a memory or at least know like, oh, oh this is a, a clone level. This is a wizard level, that kind of stuff. So although I really like the art here, I think functionally, and this looks way better than the, the final one I went with, which is just kind of functional. It's just yeah. over art from other things kind of pieced together to make a little frame. I really like the visuals here. Just functionally, it didn't achieve what I wanted. Mm. Yeah, cool looking witch pose too. I like that. <laughs> um, okay, so now I think now we're taking a look at some of your your development tools right now. Yeah, so this this is actually a shot of a level that got cut, which originally that sequence where um, the witch retraces her steps through the forest, goes to the old cabin, and kind of goes down a, a little secret passage into the sewer and into the castle. Originally, that wasn't in there at all. You just traveled through the forest mm -hmm. and arrived at a drawbridge. Uh, yeah. The castle. But um, I don't know why exactly... I switched it over in the end. We just didn't get very far with this. This was mm -hmm. um, just a pitch that uh, Kenneth uh, threw together, which looks awesome. I'm pretty happy with it. But um, yeah, it would have been a little complex because this mixes two tile sets, the forest set and the mm -hmm. castle, both which were already maxed out. So it would have been a little bit of work, but I like the water, uh, just the kind of transparency, fake transparency there and stuff. But um, and the the door looks kind of weird. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, that, that this was the idea. This was supposed yeah. to be um, like uh, Ca I think Castlevania. I was going to mention it has like a lot this. of Castlevania. Yeah, uh, I'm thinking more Symphony of the Night. I imagine there's a bridge going to uh, uh, close up as as you go over it. But... Yeah, that's kind of what I'm picturing. Maybe I'm confusing the two. Um, but yeah, exactly. That's kind of what it was meant to be. But I wouldn't have been able to do, pull something like that off. So. Um, yeah, it kind of was kind of half baked, and it was easier just to make a secret entrance. But yeah, that's you mentioned the tools. That's a, mm -hmm. a screen tool, which is how I build all the um, full screen images, like the tiles, the title screen, mm -hmm. the, it's the uh, um, the ending screen, stuff like that. I use this to lay it out, and I also use this to lay out my meta tiles, which okay. are the two by two sprites that make up the levels. So I, I have one for every section of the game, and those look much less nice. They're just kind of random mm. chunks of tiles all over the place, and then I use that to um, build the levels themselves. Um, so we're looking at, uh, you titled this one Alternate uh, um, Witch um, Ideas. Um, yeah. Different scales, but also it looks like different ages at the same time, too. Yeah, it's, so this was around after we finished the uh, the Nestev competition build. I really wanted to change the witch. Um, some people really like it, which is cool, and it, it's a bit of controversial change, as much as it can be, I guess, on any SK. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't like so the <clears throat> the witch that's in that version is basically just the Pico Eight witch um, ported directly to NES, but. The graphics uh, requirements for Pico 8 versus NES are quite different. You can essentially use all colors everywhere. It doesn't have the same palette limits and stuff that uh, the NES has. So it became kind of a watered down version of the Pico or yeah, of the Pico 8 Witch sprite. So I always wanted to change it, make it more um, like NES esque, more like vibrant, bold, cartoony. So yeah, we went through a lot of iteration uh, trying to figure out. Yeah, what what the witch should look like, and yeah, here we were playing with different sizes. I think the one in the bottom right is probably the closest to mm -hmm. um, where we ended. But I'm pretty sure this stuff was by uh, uh, Zoltan as well. But uh, Alp ended up doing the final, which, which I don't know if I sent you, but I have another one that's like a huge strip of like. Actually, I have that one uh, coming up right after this. So mm -hmm. if you want, we can go right into that one. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so this one shows. So that one that we just looked at was kind of a dead end. We didn't end up pursuing any of those ideas. And this mm -hmm. one is what uh, led to the, the actual which. So yeah, the one on the far left there is the one I was talking about that's mm -hmm. essentially a one-to-one -one port of uh, the Pico 8 game. And then the far right is the final one, although the colors are not quite right. We have two colors, uh, blue and pink, in the final one. But um, yeah, you can see we kind of, there's a lot of, like, I don't like the pointy hat stuff. That, that really bothers me. And then once we get out of there towards the right side, uh, we get pretty close to it, but it, it feels a bit like a uh, like a Robin Hood kind of look. Mm. Or like a cowboy hat. I don't know. Quite oh, how. yeah, like the yeah that. I guess it's because it's the hat's a little bit. The pitch is different, so now it appears a, a, a much uh, shorter hat. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, eventually we got there though. Something I'm super happy with. Help did an awesome job on that. You put up with me constantly <laughs> making <laughs> critiques and not really knowing exactly what I want. But yeah, you can see like compared to the original one, it's much more detailed. Um, yeah. A lot more when she moves there's a lot more kind of secondary animation half flapping and stuff like that so i'm i'm really happy with it so now we're taking a look at um the original clock tower yeah so this was an early mock by uh kenneth for the clock tower which is similar uh pretty close actually but there's a huge palette change in here the uh the wood is kind of ashy gray color mm -hmm. which looks pretty cool i really like how this looks but um i don't know if we changed it for palette limitation issues or just to make it feel more like wood this was supposed to feel like an old wood clock tower as i mentioned mm -hmm. before, with gears turning and stuff like that on this although the contrast i really like it doesn't really i don't know what it's really supposed to be that wood it, unless it's kind of burnt burnt out wood or something mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you can see the original witch sprite there as well, but all the gears look more or less the same. Yeah, not not too different. Now we're taking a look at uh, the ending screen. This is the the final, and then we'll we'll take a look at uh, mockups of it. Yeah, so these are two concepts um, that were pitched. They're both pretty like these would be i think work really well as a sequence mm -hmm. um we didn't really you know have the the bandwidth i guess to do a an actual cut scene here so we went with the left side which is meant to be kind of a classic mm -hmm. NES ending ninja gaiden castlevania again probably looking from a distance over at the place you just escaped if i had more time it probably would collapse and You'd see the eyes of the enemy. Yeah, it's the fades to black or something like that. But yeah, just just meaning to be a classic uh, NES ending, really. And I, yeah, I like the I like the left one because it gives you a bit more mm. scale of everything. You can tell the distance as opposed to the right one's got a bit of a feel of. Are they just looking at a model, like a model of the castle, or is it yeah. actually distance? It doesn't have the same um, perspective. To, but the the final one looks pretty close actually to that left one. Yeah, yeah. Although it's obviously kind of like catchy, but the layout, the, the composition, it's almost identical. Taking a look at this, and this kind of goes back to something I I said earlier about um, representing, I guess, different ages of the characters, and it might just be because uh, the one on the right is a is a quicker um, uh, sketch done, but. In here, it, it still looks like maybe the character... Did you have a um, a conversation or a, uh, written about how old the characters are? Because in some of these images, it, 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 it changes by, like, perceivably how old they would be. Yeah, I, th I don't think in any of the mocks we've looked at, it's intentional that they yeah. look different. So the, the main part of the game, they're supposed to be roughly um, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. adolescence and then the the prologue is five years earlier okay. so that's that's the intended age kind of a harry potter like early harry potter that kind of mm. i don't know i mean i don't know harry potter very well i probably shouldn't use that as a reference <laughs> <laughs> Actually, 13. 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, that kind of young adolescent um, mm. kids. And now we're taking a look at um, the illustration. I I think that is this is close to final, or is this final? That looks final. Yeah, that's okay. the, uh, so that's the special edition box art. So uh, Corey, who did the the standard edition as well, she put this together for me quite last minute. Actually, I originally wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. Actually, I was always going to have a special edition, but. I didn't know if I could get the art in time for the game mm. live on the store, so it was a bit of a, um, yeah, I had to kind of beg her to do it. She was super mm. kind to make time for me to do this. Um, she teaches as well. I guess she's really busy right now, but um, yeah. So this is meant to depict basically that final boss. Yeah. Um, give it a bit of character. Show some detail that's not in the game. Uh, yeah. Kind of build the lore of it and then obviously the witch and the whiz on the top of the tower and then uh the wizard there his legs are stone which mm. is um meant to call it the, the mechanic of of his levels where you turn to stone and back yeah. again switching between them so it's kind of shattering off which i think looks pretty cool with that dark you had a couple of versions of that where the legs are different colors like this one is more of a charcoal but there is a version yeah. that was more of a sand uh, earth kind of uh, tone yeah yeah i think i think originally i said um can you make it gray to match mm -hmm. the game better and she came back with this which wasn't really what i was picturing picturing kind of a light gray stone but mm -hmm. i like this so much that I, I stuck with this one looks cool too it kind of matches the witch's legs yeah it's really cool because it, it goes along more with there's some more illustrations in the manual that kind of depict scenes of the game or give it more detail. And this gives that final scene a lot more detail. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of like uh, Atari era where the covers just look nothing like the game. You know, some people hate that, but I, I love it. I think it's so <laughs> cool when they turn breakout into like an astronaut or something. <laughs> I can't remember. What yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I like that. I like taking the, somewhat abstract art style of the 8-bit systems and turning into something a little more fleshed out and filling the imagination a bit. So yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that she was able to help out with that. So she did, the girl who did this did all the illustrations in the manual as well. So now we're taking a look at uh, hand-drawn uh, guides. Um, this is the sketch of the front cover and or the poster and then mm -hmm. i have a following image that shows the final so i'll just cycle cycle to that one so here's here's the final yeah so these are this is done by uh philip the guy who does hand-drawn game guides who recently had a kickstarter super successful until the last day when it got shut down by presumably nintendo but i think he said so um but yeah he does these amazing uh, guides to NES games that are they're meant to be kind of as if you opened a a book of doodles from him a kid, I mean, a kid but someone of the era kind of playing through making notes as they go uh, little sketches of uh, enemies flushing things out maybe even imagining backstories that don't exist or weren't really kind of explained so yeah I was a huge fan of the work he did there so I reached out I actually reached out months ago to see if he had time and didn't really go anywhere. And he was just about to launch the Kickstarter, I assume. He was probably, I think he was probably working on the Metroid guide um, that launched with the Kickstarter. So uh, he didn't have a ton of time. But then when the Kickstarter shut down, like, I reached out again and mm -hmm. just to see, like, hey, what's going on? Are you doing anything? And he ended up having some free time to, um, Contribute to the contribute to the special edition, which includes this uh, hand drawn game guide. It's a it's a poster guide, so it's kind of like the uh, Nintendo Power era yeah. stuff. That's kind of the inspiration. The fold out maps, where one side is a poster, which is the thing you saw on the left or earlier, and then the back side is kind of a 
an abbreviated guide to the game. You can see the the rough layout here. So essentially, it'll tackle some of the more difficult puzzles, mm. a bit of lore, and then the final boss. It'll show all the, the puzzles there. Uh, but yeah, I've got a more recent one just now. Actually, it looks pretty pretty awesome. Nice. Yeah, this is this is really really cool. This is something um, uh, on what what. Now, when people can view this video, they can see what's offered in the limited edition. Um, mm -hmm. This is something that's really uh, interesting. I really like this one. Yeah, I think he's got like an amazing like brand and product there. Mm -hmm. He's pretty humble about it, but um, you can see the enthusiasm in his Kickstarter just yeah. loaded. Even the guides before that, I think he made originally like a hundred or something, and they just sold out instantly. Yeah constantly sold out so i think he's got something really special there people dig it um it's authentic it feels like someone who's really passionate about it. and he's yeah. um i've done some calls with him like video calls and he's got like a pretty cool collection and set up down in his uh wherever his computer set up so he's he's it's definitely like authentic he's into yeah. this um so i'm i'm super happy to get him on board um Hopefully, be the kind of his return. I'm hoping yeah. like it won't be the last. Uh, I think yeah. I think there's tons of room to make more. So yeah, I, I'm really happy so far with what he's done. Yep. All his work is is really good. I was lucky enough to get a few of the guides um, before the Kickstarter on some of his earlier uh, um, self publishing. Uh, yeah, one on the road. Yeah. Um, so he did uh, one for Zelda. He did one for Ninja Gaiden, and he did, uh, did one Contra. More. The Ninja yeah, Gaiden. Contra. Yeah. yeah. Um, but this is really exciting. One as a piece because it's it's more than just the the poster. It also has a game guide in it, and I'm also like you just kind of alluded to. I'm excited where this goes for for him. If he if he's able to kind of partner with home brewers or things that he can avoid all the licensing issues and everything and and kind of work at like things that he's really passionate about, which is you know these illustrations and, and Nintendo mm -hmm. games, you know. Yeah, it makes a really nice like add on I think for mm -hmm. a special edition because it's totally optional. There's nothing in here that you must have. In yeah, fact, people probably won't even want to look at the guy because part of the fun of the puzzle game is solving the puzzles. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think it makes a really nice addition. It's people do posters a lot, which are cool, uh, but it's got a bit of a, like a something special to it that it, it mm -hmm. is kind of a. It's almost like a well-known artist in a way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I hope people enjoy it. So we got um, not kind of related, but not kind of related. So this is a, a layout that is. I don't know if it's already appeared or it's going to appear in uh, uh, Cool Shit Mag. Yeah. Yeah, this is actually from a few months ago, um, probably earlier this year. So if people don't know, this is a magazine uh, that a guy does that covers a lot of things. It's kind of just a 80s, 90s culture magazine in a way. Yeah, there's a lot of wrestling, which I'm not super into, but uh, he seems super into it. But he's a super nice guy. He does. Um, he did a full page spread on Witch and Wiz here for the NSDEV competition. He did uh, some From Below stuff. He did like fake ad, fake magazine ads for From Below. But uh, yeah, you can check out his stuff. He, it's like five, five, six dollars mm -hmm. magazine. They're pretty. Like, no, this probably isn't the best way to show up, but they're like pretty. Like substantial magazines, they feel like EGM, something like that. Yeah. Like the, um, but yeah, he, he was nice enough to do a little preview of the Witch and Wiz back in the day. Maybe I'll do something for the release. Actually, I don't know. I haven't talked to him in a couple of weeks. Let's see, like kind of a cool moment as a yeah. see your own NES game in a video game magazine. Both things don't really exist anymore. Yeah. So it's, it's like a niche, <laughs> niche within a niche. It's great that you kind of arrange these um, these uh, partnerships or, or commissions or arrangements with all these other these other people, um, I, and it speaks well about your game that people were engaged uh, to to work with you. 
Um, but I'll, I guess also use the developer that um, you're able to make these connections out and, and people were willing and wanted to take these these options with the, the hand-drawn guides guide, the, the cool shit mags, working with limited run games, and then uh, also with the rest of the team that was on board with the game. Uh, so going back to one of the things uh, we discussed earlier, uh, accessibility in Witch and Wiz. I want to see if you can talk a little bit about that. It seemed uh, really important to you. You spent a lot of time reach out uh, to social media and getting feedback on uh, features that got integrated into the game. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, I spent some time on it. Not like a ton. A lot of this stuff with kind of modern accessibility is inherently handled by uh, the limitations of the NES. For example, subtitles aren't needed because there's no voice acting. It was more or less kind of simple to achieve what I kind of set out to do. The biggest, so I did um, camera shake, removing camera shake, because some people have trouble with the, the shaky screen. I removed, there's some timed challenges at the end of the game during the boss fight. I removed those, or I, I added the option to turn off the timer for people who have uh, motor function issues, or even like young kids, like my daughters, play with it off because it, they just can't beat the boss in 10 seconds. I also added a co-pilot feature, which is both controllers, player one and player two, both control the, the main player. So the idea there is that uh, um, one player can be the main player, but if they have trouble, a second player can kind of help here and there without having to pass the controller back and forth and break that immersion a bit. It feels a lot more natural. Um, and then all of the menus um, have linear navigation, which means up and down, always go forward and back, no matter what the visuals are. So on the uh, level select screen, for instance, left and right is the natural thing because the menu has arrows pointing left and right. Mm. It works, but also up and down work. So that's just to make sure that people who have uh, trouble seeing the screen can always navigate just by memory. So they know, hey, the option is two menu, two options down. They can uh, get there easily. And to go along with that, um, on the accessibility website, whichandwiz.com slash accessibility, I kind of break down the entire uh, menu flow. And the idea, that, like usually you would want to do this in-game where we narrate all the menus so people can understand. People who have uh, problems with seeing the game can know what the menu items they're selecting are. That's not an option on the NES. Um, so instead, I tried to, like, in kind of excruciating detail, uh, explain each menu, what the options are, what the order is. So the idea is that using a screen reader on your PC, you could understand, you could visually map, or sorry, mentally map the flow in your yeah. head and kind of go, OK, I press A and then down twice and then A. Um, I don't know how realistic that is, um, but it, it's something, hopefully. And then I found out, actually, in the process of testing this, that you can you can use a, I forget what it's called, but it's a device where you can kind of scan the screen, and it will write that to like a Word document, and then you can use a screen reader or a narrator there, which was, I'd never heard of that. It was pretty interesting. Apparently, it works quite well on the NES, probably because it has big, blocky text, but for the amount of text in the game, you kind of just need to memorize the flow. And then the last thing, which was probably the most work, was the high contrast mode. So the idea here is for someone with some vision, but maybe very little, uh, the entire game switches to, you can switch the game to a high contrast mode, where all the superfluous visuals are removed, so background sprites. Anything that's not gameplay related is removed. And all of the um, walls and floors are replaced with a single solid tile. So my thought, my hope there is that if you're a low vision player, you'll still be able to see the outline of the board and hopefully kind of um, be able to tell things apart in a more kind of uh, abstract way. So yeah, that was that's the most amount of work because it's a kind of a visual change, but um, and that's inspired by um, 
Last of Us 2 did something like that, where they added uh, tints to, to objects in the world, make it playable with low, low vision. Um, so yeah, that's sorry, that, that was kind of the feature overview. That's all the stuff I did, yeah. um, as well as like a photosensitivity warning on the website, stuff like that, uh, which was called out, as well as um, there's a section for kind of known issues, stuff that I just couldn't fix, like small font. It's yeah. kind of, it's, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it would be a major undertaking to have font changing size and stuff like that. So uh, I just added like a known issues section at the bottom of the website with possible workarounds for people who who suffer uh, from those conditions. For, for the high contrast one, did you mm -hmm. have to make another tile set or was that something in programming that you could manipulate the existing tile sets or what was displayed on screen? I had to do, um, it's not a whole new tile set, but every tile set has kind of an alternate um, tile for the background. So basically what I do is when I'm loading the level, I say, am I loading a tile that is solid? If it is, and this mode is enabled, switch to this other tile instead. So a, a large number of the tiles are all considered solid, so those all redirect to this new one. So every tile set has a new the new one. And it's a little complicated because palettes are different. Mm -hmm. um, there's the level that flips over. Stuff like that all adds a little bit of complication. It's not not crazy bad. But um, I didn't have a lot of um, user testing on that. One person took a look at it. Originally, I had it super high contrast, where it was white and black. Mm -hmm. And she said it was just like unbearable. <laughs> so I'm glad she took a look at it. So I, I changed it to more of a gray and black, which apparently works better. But okay, yeah, with all of this stuff, it's really hard to do without um, subject matter experts, mm -hmm. people who kind of live with the disabilities or are very close with somebody who does to kind of help yeah. validate the theories. Some of the stuff like Copilot, linear navigation, those are somewhat well established in modern games, but things like high contrast mode um are a bit more subject subjective and case by case it's hard to know how one game what's important for one game might not be yeah. important for another game so i hope some people get some use out of it we'll uh we'll see in the long run yeah. i think you took the the right route though because uh in my limited knowledge of the comments back on developers or players is that it's better to ask end users or um, experts in, in the matter rather than, than other people just kind of guessing at what the appropriate measures should be. So Yeah, yeah it's kind of a, a big thing in the accessibility space. Mm -hmm. um, not just kind of throwing it over the fence and saying, okay, I took a shot at it. Like, yeah. I hope it's good enough. Good luck. Um, which I really did try to bring in as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. Lots of people showed interest, had quite a bit of reaction to the request for kind of feedback, but the actual turnout for supplying feedback was pretty mm -hmm. low, to be honest. But obviously, like people just spending their free time helping me make my yeah. game better. I don't expect anything, but uh, yeah, it would have been nice to get a bit more uh, varied feedback. It was kind of like one person per um, item. and that's a little dangerous because things can be drastically different between yeah. similar, like what we would categorize as similar kind of disabilities. They can actually vary quite greatly. So I, I'm, I'm hoping for the best. I'm kind of using it mm -hmm. as a, a learning experience, but yeah, I kind of got into this. You asked, like, I think you asked maybe what the motivation was or kind of where the passion for it was. Um, so I got into this kind of through my day job. Um, which is on Gears 5, we did a, a huge like accessibility push, um, which I went into it pretty, what's the word? Um, not pessimistic, but um, I was very like, we were really working hard on that project and we were barely kind of getting it out the door. So we were mm -hmm. firing all, on all cylinders and then someone comes along and says, hey, we need to add these accessibility options. And my initial reaction was, this is pointless. We need to kind of get this game done. This is for such a small group. Let's just get it out the door. But um, after it shipped, I was blown away by how 
impactful it was to some people and how meaningful it was. Uh, we got the first perfect score from uh, caniplaythat.com for mm. uh, their um, deaf and hard of hearing review, I think, which was like, yeah, it, it completely flipped me 180. I originally, yeah, I thought of it as just kind of checking boxes to say we could kind of meet our requirements to like, oh, this is bringing in huge new groups of people. So when I do it now, I, I do like think of the human aspect. It's nice to mm -hmm. do stuff, but I do think there's a business side of it, which is there's a large group of people who are completely left out or maybe not completely left out, but could be brought in. And especially now it's still somewhat niche. So when you kind of go above and beyond, people notice and they, they kind of help promote the game, help share it with their friends. You're kind of called out as, um, yeah, as like a game to check out for those communities. So yeah, I think it's a win-win to be honest, especially stuff that's low hanging fruit. You can kind of just like the co-op or co-pilot. That was that was basically already in there, just because I did it because for everybody else to just plug in a controller and it should work, but uh, it can turn into an accessibility. And subtitles is a classic example of that. Mm -hmm. Those captionings originally for people hard of hearing, but all sorts of people use it now. Parents who don't want their kids to hear. So that's kind of where it, it started for me. And yeah, I just see it as an opportunity to kind of bring in more people. Um, it's a nice feeling to do so yeah it's kind of win-win uh, even though you didn't get as much um participation or testing uh, as you hoped this could be the leaving open the door to to get more as it goes forward because you might get a large community to play it as a result of this and you might end up getting more feedback that would have been nice to have before you ship the game but you could use that on future projects you know yeah absolutely yeah i don't think anyone will be like what the hell you you told yeah us. i think it's so um not done that it's kind of one of those cases of just anything is better than nothing and hopefully it can grow from there and uh yeah it, it's it's a hard one too because a lot of the when i reached out um it's kind of a niche within a niche right it's a particular set of disabilities it's a retro it's a gamer and a retro gamer and maybe even homebrew <laughs> gamer so the amount of people that are kind of into that on their own is pretty small um so i was like in a perfect world i'd love to hear from people who play retro games and have accessibility problems just today as opposed to like hey are do you think these things would help people who play Mm -hmm. And then they can just say, like, yeah, the buttons are really hard to use, or um, games don't support this controller that I need for my uh, mobility issues, or uh, games have too much text and it's hard for me to read. I wish they would just do it in big, have images to go with all their cutscenes. So I don't know. I'm just making stuff up, but something like that where I could address like actual issues that are happening today as opposed to kind of guessing what issues are. So, yeah. Maybe. But anyway, it's like, <laughs> it's just for trying to take a step forward in Shadow Time. Doesn't have yeah. to be day one. Yeah, and then hopefully uh, other uh, developers take a look at this and do their own initiatives or at least take a look at the features that you integrated and put those in their games as well. Yeah, I think Copilot is like the, I would, I would think any game, any game that's not two player could do that fairly easily, which is, as I said, just both controllers control the first player. And it, that goes way beyond kind of people with motor control or visual problems. Like, as I said, kids, play with your mm -hmm. kids. Uh, you don't have to pass the controller. Or just family. Like, I don't know. I'm sure you did it when you were a kid where your brother is playing and you're holding the second tr controller and pretending you're playing. Like, it's, it's nice to be able to actually do something. So, yeah. yeah. Um. Do you have anything else for for this, or I, we can kind of talk about um, take a look quickly at your Pico Eight uh, project for the game? No, I think that's it. So yeah, as I probably said a million times already, I'm super open to feedback on the accessibility stuff. So as well as I'm also really interested in the entire experience, meaning getting the game, downloading the game, accessing the accessibility website because mm. because I think there's a, a emulators is a big one. Yeah. Um, 
ever drive, like how you're playing the game. I think there's a lot of stuff outside the game that could also hinder people. Mm. Um, there's a lot of steps to, I find that even like I was talking with my mom yesterday saying the game came out. She's like, Oh, can I play it on my phone? And I'm like, well, yeah, you can download RetroArch and <laughs> get an itch account. And I'm like, Oh, this is pretty inaccessible for someone who's not technical savvy. So yeah. stuff, yeah, I think that's like a, a bit of a red flag to me that I can't just send it to someone. Uh, and they click a button and play. So, yes, anything, anything in the game, around the game, the website, is it narrating well, stuff like that. Yeah, that's about it. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that's really true that y- you may not know how they're going to play the game. So, you may have figured, oh, they're going to play this on their, on their NES console, but then, oh, I'm going to play it on my phone. And <laughs> I've never done that before. How do I do that? How, you know, that's yeah. true. All right, let's take a, let's take a look at the Pico 8. Um, uh, page then yeah so this is basically where the game started it was about uh 2017 early 2017 um i don't remember exactly how it came to be but i met up with this artist neville stern i i think he goes by a different name on here it's a little blurry i can't see it but um anyway the artist on this we kind of met up virtually and said like hey let's work on a game what do we want to do Pico 8 games, stuff like that. And he suggested um, doing something based on this game, his favorite game, or one of his favorite games is a kid called Catrap or Pitman <laughs> for the Game Boy, which is, uh, yeah, very similar to Witch and Wiz, the core mechanic. It's a Sokoban style game, pushing blocks, they fall, kill all the enemies, clear the screen, 100 levels, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, this was basically an homage to that. It has the the core gameplay from that game, which is the one witch pushing blocks, cobwebs, and then um, the second gameplay mechanic, which is the witch and the wizard switching back and forth. So those two things were in the original uh, the trap for Game Boy. And then we added a third gameplay mechanic, which is the clone witch, which is moving two um, characters at the same time. So we, yeah, we built this. This is 32 levels built over... I think a month or two. This was, I think I mentioned it earlier. This is, this was coming out of uh, having just finished a game a month project for um, about a year that I had been working, like doing a game a month for a year. And so I wanted something a little bit more fleshed out, not huge, but not like killing myself just to get anything on screen, something a little bit more polished. So uh, yeah, this is, this is what that, that became. Um, yeah. So there's it, 32 levels. Um, hmm. The same 32 levels that are in the Nestev competition are in here. It's interesting um, taking a look at this because, you know, obviously the graphical style is different and everything, but something you may think that, you know, may not think that makes a big impact, but like the the focusing on the Pico 8 version, you're more focused in on the field. So there's a panning within the level, which makes a a, a big difference in actual actually playing the game, how you yeah. experience it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't know if you were hinting that it was a, a worse thing or a better thing, but personally not, I don't like yeah. it. Not I, not not going one way or the other, it's just going from <laughs> the other one to that one you're like having since I played the NES version first, I'm like, wow, I wish I could see this whole yeah, exactly. Fields, you know? <laughs> yeah, to me, it's kind of... I feel like unless the game is designed around the idea of scrolling the screen, like there's some... Mm-hmm. That's part of the puzzle in some way. Seeing the whole play field in one view is really important for a puzzle game to me. Yeah. I think forcing people to scroll around is just making it harder in an uninteresting way. Again, and get unless maybe it was designed that way. So... uh yeah, that was just so Pico 8 is 128 by 128 pixels, whereas the NES is 256 by 240. So it's about half the size or a quarter, depending on mm-hmm. a quarter the size of uh, NES resolution. So it actually worked out perfect because all of the maps in the Pico 8 version fit on one screen on an NES, um, just by chance, really. Um, so yeah, that was great. But yeah, yeah, it has screen scrolling. It's a little more fast paced. Um, we talked about it before a bit, where 
you can move while things are falling, which is, mm -hmm. I like that a lot more about this one. It's got a lot more color. The Pico 8 limitations for color um, are just 16 colors, but you can use them as you please. There's no limit. So a single sprite could be all 16 colors. The background can be all 16 colors. It doesn't have the same kind of name table uh, or four palette collections like the NES does. So translating that to the NES was somewhat challenging, which is why we basically did everything from scratch for the NES. Um, but I, I feel like the NES looks better. I'm just looking at the, the screenshots now. Um, yeah, I like the NES look a lot more. It's more vibrant. It's got a bit more character to it. Yeah. I like this too. I was very proud of this. Yeah. Oh yeah. And you can see here in the fun facts part, it was uh, 32 kilobytes for the whole game. So that's like less than an NROM game. Yeah. And it's in Lua. So it's, it's a bit more verbose. So it's, it's hard to squeeze a lot in, into a Pico 8 game. Nice part about Pico 8 is you can have multiple cartridges, kind of like a PlayStation game where you swap CDs. Mm, you do the same thing with Pico 8, but I didn't do it in this case. But yeah, this pretty much uses every square inch of the map. That's actually why some of the levels are these tiny vertical spaces. And mm -hmm. I basically have this giant canvas for the map. Um, and I kind of filled it in with puzzles. And then we were left over with these little gaps so we'd say okay what puzzle can we fit in like a three by four space of this map yeah. with these tiny little puzzles and stuff so it was, it was quite fun actually that part but yeah it's it's basically like the nest dev competition build of uh witch and whiz is mm -hmm. a, essentially a carbon copy of this but all written from scratch nothing was really reusable in code or anything like that just the experience the knowledge gained from doing this what kind of problems i'm going to have stuff like yeah. that um yeah more or less written from scratch so i guess that kind of leads me into you know what the last thing i wanted to say about it was you know just congratulations on a great game and i'm excited to see uh this your success on it oh, thanks so much i appreciate it um i guess you know before um, I don't want to cut you off or close or anything. So, you have anything else you want us to talk about? Um, I kind of got through everything I wanted to say about it. Um, not really. Like, just uh, go check out the game on Limited Run. It'll be there. Um, I don't have an exact date, but it's it's going live on November twelfth, and I believe it's going to be open pre-orders for a month. Mm -hmm. It's a little funny because we switched the release date, so I'm just not a hundred percent sure when the if the end date changed as well. But yeah. Roughly until kind of mid mid December, let's say. So yeah, go check it out. See if it's something you're into. Um, at the same time, it's going to be on itch.io for uh, I think ten dollars um, for the digital copy. It's going to come with the soundtrack, some wallpapers, uh, the manual, stuff like that, kind of your standard stuff. And then uh, I think we mentioned earlier it'll also be on Pie Packer is free streaming service so you can check out the game for free if you're kind of on the fence you don't really need to have it on an ever ever drive or you don't necessarily need to own it uh you can go play the full game there's no limits no time limits it's the exact game that you buy so uh, lots of ways to play i just would love to yeah get more people playing come talk to me on discord i have my own uh discord server where we talk about the game a lot um yeah that's about it all right, great, Matt. Thanks for joining me. I, I really appreciate it, and, and thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, everyone. Uh, you can tune in to the, the next episode of uh, Homebrews in Focus. We'll be meeting with another developer talking about another homebrew. Thanks, everyone.